right, welcome everyone to the Tuesday, May 5th commission meeting. Uh, my mustache is going to get this call to order at five on the dot. We're going to start out with a moment of silence. Mr. Pritchett? I have a motion as to the February 11th and February 20th minutes. I heard a motion from Commissioner Pritchett. I'll second it. All in favor of approval, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Passes unanimously. I'm going to move F is in Foxtrot 22 up to where E typically would be. I just wasn't sure who we'd have today. Uh, so, Sheriff, if you want to come down. And of course, my computer's not, not liking me and not wanting to pull this up. Eden, do you have a copy of the actual resolution? Yeah, my link is not working on this. So you rely on technology, Sheriff, and this is what happens? Hey, I understand, sir. Yeah. Oh, hey, there's that good film. Oh, that's kind of numbers. That's outside the box thinking right there, though. Thanks. Well, cover my mug, I guess. <laughs> All right, so the resolution reads as follows. Uh, Whereas the citizens of Brevard County are privileged to have a group of brave men and women who are trained professionals who serve, uh, serve on a daily basis unarmed in the Brevard County Jail. And whereas these men and women are certified through the Florida Department of Law Enforcement upon completion of a corrections officer's state exam. And whereas the Brevard County Jail houses inmates both sentenced and pretrial on charges ranging from municipal ordinance violations to capital felonies and the daily management of inmates requires special training, sound judgment, and courage. And whereas working as a corrections deputy is one of the most dangerous and challenging professions in the world today, and whereas these corrections deputies and corrections supervisors provide essential services and exemplify the highest of professional standards by their commitment to the citizens of Brevard County and to the Brevard County Sheriff's Office. Now therefore be it resolved, the uh, Board of County Commissioners of Brevard County, Florida, does hereby proclaim the week of May 3rd through May 9th, 2020 as officer, uh, Corrections Officers Appreciation Week. May I have a motion? All right, a motion from Commissioner Pritchett. Second. I'll go ahead and second it. Are you second it? I did. All right. We have a second from Commissioner Smith in that, in that case. Let's uh, go ahead. All in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed? All right, passes unanimously. Sheriff, floor is yours, sir. Sure. Thank you, sir, for uh, for not only introducing the resolution, but um, to the entire commission for recognizing our correctional team. Um, today is a very melancholy day as we uh, talk about uh, National Correctional Officers uh, Week for um, our entire country. As everybody is probably aware, last night we lost one of our own out of our corrections team, uh, Deputy Stephen Goodson, who was involved in an off-duty traffic crash. And uh, um, our thoughts and prayers are with him and, and his family as well as um, the family of um, another person who um, is deceased from that accident as well. So um, certainly impacts our entire community. But to the men and women that work each and every day at our, our facility, um, uh, as you said, it's one of the most dangerous jobs uh, in, the, in the criminal justice field. They are there um, certainly with the worst of the worst at times. They're not only responsible for making sure that they um, uh, are maintained in the facility, but also for taking care of them and making sure that um, they have the things that they need, um, making sure that they have the proper medical attention, the proper um, diet, all of the different things that go along with that. So it's a, it's a job that um, often comes with little uh, reward or little recognition, but um, certainly this commission has done a great job through the years of recognizing our correctional deputies, our correctional team for all the things they do. I, I tell people all the time, I'm surrounded by an amazing team and I'm smart enough to stay out of their way. And uh, our corrections team certainly um, puts an exclamation point on that. They do a great job each and every day out there. You've got some solid civilian personnel over there, too. We absolutely do. The whole team. So, but uh, again, thank you, thank you guys. Thanks. And I believe Mr. Abate has a, uh, a frame resolution yeah. for you. So, thank you, guys. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you all for coming out. So we'll, um, we'll do it like this. Sure. Oh, we'll do this. Okay. Do you want me to do the bunny ears, Sheriff? <laughs> Thank you. 
If I don't get a haircut soon, you won't have to. <laughs> Thanks, sir. Take care, sir. Thank you, sir. All right, we've got, uh, we're up to the consent agenda. I'd like to pull F2. I know that we have at least one person here on account of that. Do we have speaker cards for any of the others? To your knowledge, Mr. Bonte, Mr. Denninghoff? Okay. Okay, but as as to the consent agenda, just F two. Just yeah, we have other speakers. For the night. Okay, perfect. Yeah, I just want to make sure that that we don't um, neglect to pull something if there's speakers on that item. I appreciate that. So all right, in that case, we'll go ahead and we'll address F two first, which is the adoption. Uh, of the resolution and lease agreement regarding the Space for Forever Home Animal Rescue, Inc. Uh, and I'll, I'll just give you the heads up, Commissioner Pritchett, I'm gonna be leaning on you on this one since this is up in your neck of the woods. So I don't know, staff, if, uh, who, who do we have to intro this one? Mr. Bate? Karina, all right, come on down. Good evening, commissioners. Welcome. So, Mr. Tobias, is this is that light for this? Yes. Okay. Okay. I apologize. Go ahead. Sure. Uh, this item is requesting approval of a resolution and lease agreement with Forever Home Animal Rescue Inc. Uh, this will allow the lease of county property at 2605 Flake North Flake Road in Titusville. Uh, this is, was formerly an, the North Area Animal Shelter. Uh, the annual rent is ten dollars per year. For a, un, with a contract of 10 years with two five-year renewals. The tenant will renovate and uh, maintain the existing facility at their own cost and will use it as an animal shelter. Um, Janelle Skurlock, the director of Forever, animal, Forever Home Animal Rescue, is present in the Magnolia Room to uh, speak on the item or answer any questions you may have. All right, Commissioner Tobio, what did you have, sir? Thank you. Uh, I didn't have any questions. I, oh, as are you to ready? This one? Yeah, I mean, I have comments. Are you ready for comments, Mr. Chair? Well, you're, you're first up. If you'd like, we can address them now, or we could hear from the speaker. However, you'd like to do it. Uh, why, why don't we hear from the speaker first? Okay. Is that all right with you as well, Commissioner Pritchett? Do you want to do that first, or yeah, please? And we'll, we'll go back to you right after the speaker. We had this facility, and the sheriff used to occupy it and they moved out, and so we had an empty facility for a while. Ashley was for animals at the time, and before we did this, we called up Sheriff Ivy and ran, ran this company, these people through them, and um, he believed it worked well with the, with the animal rescue community. So we had this facility, and it was actually slotted to be demolished, and the cost to demolish it was $30,000, or we could renovate it for 50,000, but nobody in the county wanted to occupy the building. So for it to sit empty, and um, I had community calling and, and were really upset about it because they felt like it was getting in disarray. The utility cost alone was $1,600 per year. So this company, these, well, these people came, and we made an agreement with them that if they wanted to do it, they were going to have to spend the $50,000 up front to renovate the building so it could be moved, moved into. And then they could um, go ahead and lease it for a period of time. It would save us demolishing costs or electricity costs through the years. The um, concern I had was I didn't know if they had enough funds to really do the renovation in year one. So what we did is this, we wrote into it that for this agreement to um, work, that they had to have all of the renovations done. In year one, they had to go ahead and make the $50,000 investment to make the um, building okay to be used for the um, project that they want to do for rescuing the uh, animals. So I just want to give you all that information. And um, I want to thank staff and Ms. Bentley and Karina for doing all the work putting this together. You guys really brainstormed that. Um, Good project. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Commissioner. Let's go ahead and hear the uh, the comment, if we could. Welcome. If you could Hello. just start out with your name and the city that you reside in. Janelle Scarlock. Thank you. All right. You've got the floor. So we have been running the rescue from our personal home for three years now. We have had 
animal control come out along with code enforcement to make sure that everything has been all right and everything has checked out fine, but we do have a limit on animals that we are allowed to take in, which is four adult animal dogs at a time, meaning over the age of six months, which kind of puts a hurt on us, but also the community on us having to turn away animals because of what we're allowed capacity to, versus if we're allowed to take in the building, we have 38 dog kennels there and more cat rooms, so we'll be benefiting all of Brevard County, and we won't have to turn away any. I know SPCA right now is overfilled. We have continued to take in animals through the COVID-19 when other shelters have had to unfortunately shut down because of their building but we do have people willing to donate time, effort, and money also from the community. And also we are willing to bring the res um, renovations up to code and up to standards to make it habitable for also the humans and the animals. And just this year alone, in 2019, we took in 75 cats and 142 dogs. All right, I appreciate it. Mr. Pritchett, would you like to make a motion on this one? Did Commissioner Tobias want to ask? Some oh, I apologize. First? I'm sorry, Commissioner Tobias. I, I told you we were going to get back to you. I promise I'm not trying to skip no you. Yes, sir. Thank uh, you. Thank you so much, Mr. Chair. And on the face, I think this sounds good. Um, potentially saving us from demolishing and potentially saving uh, us from remodeling. What it unfortunately doesn't take into account is the fair market value uh, of the building. Um, what we do know is this is a five and a quarter acre property. Uh, they only have a portion of that. The property appraiser listed this last year as $659,700. Um, to do a fair analysis, I think it would be incumbent on us to put this out and see what the fair market value is before we entered into a 10-year uh, lease that will bring uh, what amounts to a nominal $100 back into the coffers. I think the math doesn't work if this is worth $75,000 and somebody is willing to then uh, bring it up to code or then demolish it and use it for some other uh, purpose. But when we take into account, uh, especially in these tough times, uh, the fair market value of this, even if it is 10% of that uh, uh, property, then that amounts to tens of thousands of dollars. So uh, again, I would not against this project, but I certainly would like this to go out to bid. And if we found out that this was actually uh, had no value to it whatsoever, then this seems like it would be an admirable way to go. But until uh, we know what other folks are willing to pay for that and thus making taxpayers whole, I have to vote against this. Commissioner Pritchett. Thank you, sir. I, I think, I know what you're saying, Commissioner Tobias, I think this little section of it um, is, is probably not a value to this, this little building. And the, what's the problem with this too, I, Ms. Bentley, I think this has to serve a public purpose in that area, correct? So I think there's a little bit of limitations on it. Just, you guys, we, I've Hang been on here. Hang on one second, Commissioner. Logan, could you turn on Ms. Bentley's on. mic? Oh, is it working now? It was my fault. Like, okay, I apologize. Oh, Ms. Bentley. So I, I think there, there's a lot of um, restrictions on this, but I, I haven't been approached by anybody wanting to move in. It's really messy. And um, we actually were trying to get cost to go ahead and demo it, and it probably would have just sat there empty anyways. So I don't know of anything we we're planning to do on this property besides because of the uh, county um, business that's on around it. And they had actually talked about one time, the county was talking about maybe using it, and then they decided they didn't even want to move into it. So I, I'm not real sure that anything else will be different with this building. Commissioner Smith. Commissioner Tobias, you said it was a five and a quarter acre. Is that what you said? Uh, uh, Mr. Chair. Please. Yes, uh, according to the proper appraiser, 5.25 acres, last year's valuation, $659,700. So could we subdivide this and just how much property does this animal so if we were to subdivide that building out, we would still have probably four and a half acres to sell. We wouldn't want to sell it because on that property we have 
the road and bridge north office and their shop they work out of so it is still county property we're still going to be staying mm -hmm. on that property we won't be selling the rest of it commissioner the the other concern i have is as miss bentley mentioned is if we're restricted in the purposes that land can be used for i don't know that we can just sell it to the highest bidder i don't mm -hmm. know that we're permitted to do that miss bentley if you go out to bid you can okay we, we can but this is a this is a, a transfer under 242, which requires a community benefit and a supermajority vote. So it's not, it's not a bid. So a, as to the lease, Karina, I don't know if you could help us out. It's not for that entire piece of property that's contemplated, is it? It's just for the building. Okay, that's, that's what I understood. So we, in that case, if we wanted to go ahead and sell the remaining portion of that property, obviously leaving enough that they won't have issues with respect to the subdivision, could we go ahead and do that? I'm assuming that there's park. I'm not. I have never been up there, but I'm assuming there's parking there that's associated with the use. So, okay. uh, I would need to get more information on that to really answer that question. I appreciate it. So the the entire property is valued at five and a quarter. Uh, Six hundred fifty-nine thousand. Six hundred fifty-nine thousand. Correct. It's the entire, but five and a quarter acres. And if they need three quarters or half an acre for this building. But you're saying we, we utilize this property for other things? Yes, road and bridge are there, and their shop is there also with offices. So we're not going to be moving. We're gonna, the county will be staying there doing business. Hmm. The legal description says it's 0.34 acres. This, this portion is 0.34 acres? Yeah. There, there is also a large fenced-in area that I assume will be used for outdoor uh, animal shelter, whatever is they that, do to exercise the animals. Is that included within the scope of the lease? Uh, is it? So do we have a, even if it's not a precise idea, do we have a rough idea in terms it of the additional amount of space? I don't know. But it does describe it as the property to be leased. So I, I think I made a mistake earlier by selling, saying the building. It's the entire property to be leased. So maybe, and Commissioner Pritchett, I'm, I'm just trying to figure out the best way to do this that doesn't limit us in the future, because I, I don't want to do something that's going to prevent them from, from doing what they're, they're setting out to do, which I think is, is certainly providing the community service, and if anything, you know, certainly helps reduce the burden on the other shelters that are around here, including BCSOs. Um, my thought is perhaps if we could vote on something that's a little more limited to the building and maybe a certain distance out from the building that we can specify by bringing this back at the next meeting, I certainly would support that. I, I'm not, you know, I'm not I, disinclined. I, I, I know the area. I don't think it's under risk of somebody wanting to move in there. And uh, we, we talked to them. They wanted to move in and, and us do stuff. And I'm like, no, no. If you can't show me you come up with enough money to renovate this building, we're going to demo it. And the, they said, okay, we'll do it within the first year. You can have it back. So I, I, think this, I think this is probably a really good fit for this area of knowing all the stuff that we have there and knowing that it was utilized for this in the past. And we're going to have the renovations done. I lose a, a, a problem in that area. It's, it's low income area. Okay. And I, I think it's a little bit risky right now leaving it empty. So I think this is just a good fix for the whole. I'll, I mean, it's, it's your district. I'll support you on it in that case. Commissioner okay. Tobias? Yeah, I think there was a little bit of a misunderstanding. Um, I, I, Ms. Bentley, help me if I'm wrong here. A public good is what we need to signify in order to provide them with a nominal lease. If it goes to bid, there's no public good. It's whoever is the highest bidder. Okay, so, so to be clear, if we put it out to bid, uh, you know, an adult bookstore could be there. No public good, but if they were a high bidder, they could have it. Now, I don't think that's going to happen, but public good is only for a nominal lease. It is not for an open and competitive bid. But and if, if it came back with an open and competitive bid and no one was offering it, then I think this was a great deal. But without that information, um, I don't think it's the wise, uh, I mean, just running the math, um, assuming the uh, percent is accurate, it would make the land value uh, worth about $43,000, assuming that the percentage of that 5.25 acres. As you know, the first foot is always worth more than the last foot. 
Uh, but nonetheless, th that's, that's the numbers uh, we're conceivably looking at. Commissioner so, Pritchett? So you're saying uh, that Hang on one sec, Commissioner Smith. Uh, we'll have Commissioner Pritchett and then you, sir. Oh, I was just going to say it backs up to the airport, too. This is just such an odd piece of property. Um, I, I don't know, guys. I, I want to make a motion to approve it, but I hear you, but we'll see where the votes go. But I'll second that for discussion. Commissioner Smith? I don't know if you guys can see. I've been hitting my button. Oh, no, it's not coming up at all. Okay. No, I, don't have, I don't have a button. Just kind of, throw something in. Just kind of flail over there, and I'll, <laughs> I'll try to pay. Yeah, around. I'll try to pay good attention to that okay. side. <laughs> well, you go ahead. I already talked. To you. Uh, he's deferring to me, I guess. All right. Um, anyway, uh, I don't have a problem with this at all. I mean, it's it's a property that wasn't being used. It was a property that was going to be too expensive to demolish, and it's going to reduce the burden on um, our existing shelter and on other nonprofits. So. It's something that we should be doing, and I don't have a, I don't have an issue with this lease at all. I don't have a problem coming back and looking at it if, if we're not utilizing all that land, if we want to look at, you know, taking a portion of it out. But as it stands right now, I have, I have no issue with this at all. Because I think in the long run it's going to save us money and it's going to get more animals out off the streets and, and adopted, and it's going to take care of, of that burden that we have now. So Thank you. Ms. Mr. Abate had something. Do you want to go first, Mr. No, Smith? Mr. Or? Abate, I'd like to hear what he said. Mr. Smith, to, Mr. Abate? To, to clarify, for the lease, um, while there is a little bit of land, it's like less than half an acre total with the, with the building. The uh -huh. other five acres is currently occupied by Road and Bridge, the whole other five acres of this parcel. I think that obviates the concern that I had. I appreciate that. And I don't mean to cut in, but the fact that Road and Bridge is utilizing it as well is an issue because they would have to be displaced, correct, if we went and put this property up, unless we just carve them out. I mean, that's something to I consider. Want to be there. It certainly limits the pool of prospective bidders all the more. Commissioner Smith, do you have something, sir? No, because with the additional information, I, I was going in a different direction. Oh. If, if we're only talking about the, the small portion underneath this building and the other almost five acres is still being used by the county, then the property isn't valued at that kind of money. So there's no, nothing to be gained with any constructive ideas on how to do it differently. Fair enough. All right, I'll go ahead and call the question since we don't have any more lights on at this point. All in favor, please. Oh, Mr. Bonte, you have something there else? There was another public speaker. On this one? Yes. Oh, I apologize. Let's go ahead and have that. Yeah, I apologize. I, I didn't know you were over there. I certainly am sorry. I didn't intend to skip you there. Oh, that's fine. Um, I'm here representing Fur Animal Rescue. Could Can you, you, could you just start with your, your name and the city you reside in, sir? Uh, Shay Little. I reside at Port St. John, Florida. Thank you, sir. You've got the floor. Okay, I'm here to represent uh, Fur Animal Rescue. And what I'm here to talk about really is just facts, things that, are, that you may or may not know about. Uh, as of about eight months ago, if you were to go and try to turn an animal into an SPCA or into a humane society, they wouldn't be able to take them because they were all filled up. There was a waiting list of 487 animals waiting to get in. All right. Janelle, Sherlock, and David are really fine people, and I'm sure you probably had a taste of them here today. But what I wanted to say to you briefly is that this is a good thing for the community. If we can take some of the burden off of the community and get these animals in, then maybe we can provide a way to keep the diseases off the streets and help people find a new home for animals. You know, this is a, I think this is a really good thing for the community. There's going to be a lot of volunteers involved. There's going to be a lot of good people involved. You know, I think uh, we're going to do some really magnificent things on the property, get cameras, get the electrical, we'll get the plumbing going. There's a lot of, a lot of good things to be going to the property. As the gentleman, John, as you said on the end there about the... Uh, value of the property being worth six hundred and fifty nine thousand dollars. I you know, I I respect that. You know, I know I realize and you realize a lot of things come down to money. But this is more than just about money. This is about saving dogs and cats and animals lives. You know, we already have a facility in this county that would allow us to save more. It's already built. It just needs to be fixed. You know? And we got good people that want to come to the table 
and present this and help these things, help these animals, you know? Um, at one time, we were told that the property wasn't owned by the county, but it was owned by the airport. They were going to put a fuel depot there. But finally, we got down to the, to the we got down to the basics of it, and we were told, you know, the county owned it, and they were actually willing to help us do something with this. And it was really kind the way they stepped up to the plate with us, you know. And I, I really, honestly, from the bottom of my heart, I thank you for doing that, you know. I do realize that there's a $659,000 profit that can be made on that property if you were to sell the whole thing, kit and removal, but we're only talking about an acre, you know? An acre of property that could be used to save animals. Not only that, but you didn't know it, but we have in the back, there's four horse stalls. So not only can we save dogs and cats, but we can save, we can save horses as well and pigs and goats, you know, whatever. And, and what happens is there was like 3.1 million animals. Sir, I apologize for cutting you off, but you're, you're out of time. Um, the good news I have that offsets that, though, is I'm, I'm pretty sure you're, you're going to get what you want with respect to this motion, just um, seeing where the cards fall. Is that it as far as public comment? Yes. Thank you, sir. All right. Thank you. Thank you. All right, so let's go ahead. We'll call the question. So all in favor of this item, please say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Nay. All right, passes 4-1 with Commissioner Tobias in the negative. Mr. Denninghoff, um, as to the other consent items, do we have public speakers at any of them, to your knowledge? And Mr. Bonte? Only to the extent that the items were pulled by the board, so it was only okay. to address it. All right, Mr. Tobias, or Commissioner Tobias, I apologize. You had an item or two that you wanted to pull? Right. F6, okay, so we'll pull F6 as well. As to the remainder, obviously F2 is already resolved. As to the remainder, excluding F2 and F6, could I have a motion to approve? All right, I have a motion from Commissioner Smith. I'll second it. All in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed? All right, passes unanimously. So all of the consent, less F2, which we've already addressed, and F6, which we'll address now, um, we've passed. So F6... And I, I know we do have someone from KBB. And Yuri, Yuri, do you want to introduce this one real quick? Thank you, sir. Commissioners, what we have here is uh, two items in one. One is the contract for providing litter control and, and, uh, and recycling education. And the other one is for the lease for providing support to, to KBB. The lease requires a supermajority vote because it's non-competitive. It's on, right now, it's on property that is residing on Adamson Road, surrounded on three sides by landfill property, um, probably about a mile and a half north of 524, and we're requesting approval for the same. All right, Commissioner Tobias. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Yes, sir. Uh, unlike, I guess, Forever Home or whatever we just voted for, KBB is operating in what could arguably um, be considered a competitive market. Uh, other words, by providing this nominal lease, we're putting our thumb on a scale and make it nearly impossible for businesses to compete in said market. Uh, the fact that this is a well-connected, not-for-profit, not that people like the mayor of Palm Bay sit on their board should mean nothing when considering contracts related to services to the county. Uh, making matters even worse, KBB seems to make a habit of asking for handouts in relation to their continually, uh, continual contractual obligations to taxpayers. Recall, just a year ago, they came to us and begged for $15,000 outside of, in fact, they begged for quite a bit more had it not been for Commissioner Smith uh, rightly bringing that uh, amount down quite a bit for a truck outside of said contract. Um, also, there's liabi liability issues here uh, with these nominal leases. Uh, while the contract calls for uh, in in indemnification against uh, tort claims relating to this property, uh, as you know, Mr. Chair, this is not a silver bullet. Uh, we may still be named in lawsuits and be forced to defend ourselves as part of any legal action. 
Should uh, it, the space be reasonably necessary to carry out uh, for the contract of services, the space should be included as part of the contract and directly tied to it. Uh, I would uh, make a request um, that uh, we put this out for a competitive bid uh, separately uh, or uh, together. That way we'd have a better idea. The best I could get the last time this was put out for bid was many, many, many years ago, I think 2001 or something like that, that we looked at this cumulatively. So um, I certainly will make a motion uh, after, you know, uh, to, to reject this contract and put it up for bid, Mr. Chair. I may end up seconding that. I just want to hear a little bit more first. Um, Yuri, with respect to that, is there a reason that we haven't put it out to bid in the past 19 or so years? That property was never put out for bid. It was uh, at one time occupied by the, by the county, by solid waste, as their administrative offices. Those administration, once I became director, got consolidated. I had at that time engineers on one side, you know, accountants in the other, so everything got consolidated into Vieira, and the property went unoccupied. Well, let me, let me ask we you. We were approached by KBB at that time to see if they could lease it and that's why it's two separate contracts because they had a prior contract and then this one came after the fact. I, I think what Commissioner Tobias was talking about, and correct me if I'm wrong please sir, was the, the contract with KBB, not the lease of that particular location. And is that, is that what you're referring to, Commissioner Tobias? Y yes, it's the, the contract for service. Now I, I believe there is value in the forever forever home one that we just nominally to the best of my knowledge speaking with yuri there is where this is located there is no value this is in that facility in which you know is a dump in all honesty and and probably we we would have no other use but my point is that we've had a contract here that hasn't been competitively bid and things get piled on Thus, it's very difficult to create what, whether or not this is a fair contract as it's been so many years and there's been many additions. An example being last year when a truck was needed to be added on. Thank you. If we're talking about the, uh, the service part of it, that originated in the 90s and it was here before I came uh, to Solid Waste in 93. So I'm not sure it was ever put out for bid. I, I can't answer that question. And just, just out of curiosity, before I turn it over to Commissioner Pritchett for comments, uh, how long would something like this take for you to get to a position where we could put it out for bid if that's the direction the board wants to go? Well, we have a contract, then an RFP would be put out on based on the contract. The contract expires in, I think, June 30th or June 1st. I can't remember exactly, but the framework of the RFP is already contained in the contract. I appreciate it. Commissioner Pritchett? Just a quick question, Yuri. When we were getting briefed, you told me this could be kind of split into two segments, one building and one for the other part of the contract? That is how it's presented right now, ma'am. It's, it's two separate uh, contracts, one for the building, one for the agreement Okay. for the service. So what for the building, it's not hardly anything, is it? So the most of this money is going for the service, and it's more than educational costs, correct? It's education and little control. Control. Recycling education and litter control. Okay, thank you. The um, lease itself is, I think, one dollar a year. Commissioner Tobias, is that a new light, sir? Okay. Oh, thank you, Commissioner Smith. Oh, you beat me to it. All right, Commissioner Smith has gone ahead and seconded it. Um, any discussion on on the motion to reject this item, Commissioner Pritchett? Commissioner Snardi? <laughs> no, I doubt that. <laughs> Trying I to shut that. me down over there? No, no. No, I don't have a problem going out to bed. You know, I have a feeling that KBB probably will come out on top, but I, I don't, uh, definitely don't mind doing that. I mean, the, the, the idea is, is if government does it, it's going to cost a lot more than if an organization that uses multiple volunteers. So I, I, I actually have faith that KBB will probably win that bid, but I don't have a problem putting it out. Commissioner, can I yes, have sir. a suggestion? Please. Uh, since it's about to expire and KBB is currently occupying the property, I think it's best if we were to extend the 
current contract for a period of time while we do the RFP. How long? That way we wouldn't have to tell them you got to go and now you can come back. How long do you think is reasonable? Um, I would say 60 to 90 days, not more than that. Presu I, I would be okay with that, presuming they agree to the same terms. It would be under what, the... Oh. What do you all think? Okay, I'm seeing at least two other heads nodding, so that's a good thing, and that's not a supermajority question. All right, so let's, I guess we'll address this two different ways. We'll, we'll go ahead and we'll, we'll take the motion that's already been seconded to reject the item. Um, we, did we or did we not have public comment on this, th though, Mr. Abate? You, you do have uh, KBB here to speak. Okay, let's, let's give them their opportunity before we have a vote. I think they certainly owed that. Thanks, Yuri. Welcome. Good evening, Commissioners. My name is Brian Bobbitt. I'm Executive Director of Keep of Our Beautiful. Um, I want to thank everyone for the opportunity of uh, let, allowing us to speak today to the subject. Uh, real quick, when it comes to the contract, um, and, and again, uh, as Commissioner Hanson already mentioned, uh, everything we do is based on community involvement, and we have a very, very strong following. When the fish kills happened in 2016 and 2018, we called upon our volunteer base, and within about a two-week period for each item, removed over 100,000 100, pounds of dead fish from our shorelines. Anytime there's been a natural disaster, we've had to go out there and respond, and that's what we do, and we're proud of it. We rely heavily on our volunteers, but we have a staff that needs a, a headquarters to operate. Uh, the education part of it is just a small part of this contract. It also includes um, our adoption teams, which go out and clean all of your districts. Uh, when volunteers are coming out and they want supplies, they have to come to a central location. That is where this building is. Uh, it is essential for us to be able to keep going. Uh, to give you a couple of little stats of what we've done in 2019, on the education side of it, we visit 52 different schools. We did 55 different presentations for fourth graders. Uh, it's roughly 4,300 students. 58 different presentations for fifth graders. That's roughly 4,600 uh, students. And then we also did uh, four private schools. We did a STEM conference with over 300 students. And we began a composting presentation that we're working on with Solid Waste to hopefully uh, help offset uh, or extend the, li the life of the landfill by um, diverting some of the, the waste into a compost. We have a pilot program that currently has several different participants, including the city of Melbourne, Titusville, and Satellite Beach. All that is ran out of that office. In 2019, we removed 700,000 pounds of litter from Brevard County. That was the help of 7,200 volunteers contributing over 2,100 volunteer hours, actually closer to 2,200. And that was a total of 667 different cleanups, most of which are your constituents. We really, we don't like asking for help, but we help the community and in return, that's what we ask for as well. With the truck, sir, completely separate contract. Um, we work very heavily with our community. We work very heavily with you and your constituents. We want to continue doing so, and uh, it's our pride to be part of a community like Burvard County. And um, whenever you need us, we're there. We're asking for the same. Thank you, sir. Commissioner Thank Tobias? You. I was just going to uh, repeat the motion a little bit more uh, succinctly and, and uh, you know, when you okay. were ready for that. Thank you, sir. I appreciate it. Thank you. All right, Commissioner, you've got the floor. Okay, I'd like to amend the motion by extending the current contract under the current provisions 90 days, reject the contract for services, and direct staff to develop a competitive RFP for litter and recycling education contract, and reject the proposal to extend offer of a nominal lease and direct staff to explore options uh, of said building. Commissioner Smith, will your second stand, sir? Yes. All right. All right, so his second will stand. Mr. Pritchett? Okay. All right, let's go ahead and we'll call the question on that. Unless you had anything, Commissioner Wisnardi? I don't want to skip you there. <laughs> okay. All right, all in favor of the motion is stated. Please say aye. 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 Any opposed? All right, passes 5 0. I believe that takes care of all of consent at this point. All right, public comment under G. We have five speakers for public comment. All right, let's go ahead and do that at this point, please. All right, welcome, Mr. Tovey. 
Hi, um, Charles Sophie, 2565 Roberts Road, Melbourne. Um, about what you just discussed, and I didn't have a public comment card or top of it. I can do a better job, more thorough, at bundle several services together, providing and hoping that you'll give me a chance to work with whether it be voluntary or otherwise. And um, I will have all the information. I have some pay, and I just got I'm going to place that. Uh, all of the places I do need help and work, so that's why I do them. I don't want, I'm not out there wasting time, but the same one I just did before I come to the meeting. Anyway, they cut my brake lines, they loosen up a steering wheel on a year old antique vehicle, they arson my house. There's nothing help. Nobody's assisted me in anything except for more aggression and more fun, teeth and liens. I want to know if the uh, lagoon is ready for storm season. Yet. They've done what's needed at this time. There are only a couple weeks left. And how about the sewage system? How does it work properly? And are we doing this thing necessary before the hurricane starts? And isn't this similar to the hurricane season except for the power and sewage? Um, about my neighbor. Hundreds and hundreds of cars every day, the entranceway right across the street from my house. Hundreds of horns, hundreds of lights, bright lights. Sit there like a drive in movie theater and park it a long time. And I have videos of it, I complain about it, but what do I do? And then they fly their drones over my property, and if it's flying up in the air, I'd probably say hit it. But it's about 75 feet. Um, my property link. Then she can work together, either temporary lift them because they were put on my property 60 days after the fire. I had insurance company never settled, so I've had no chance or any way of doing anything. We cleared my property eight years ago and took everything I had to make a living. So now I'm living, living in the bushes, um, almost panhandling on the street. And why? Uh, the liens on my property. I can't do anything. And it's temporary lift them. I'll fix everything and work together cooperative with you. Also, I need a place with a raccoon. They're worse than bears. You two or three raccoons together and they're tearing everything up and you didn't allow me to cover up my windows or anything. They so were on so they're tearing and it's okay. Help me, uh, Mr. Smith, it's in your area and I'm going uh, to find a safe place for the lagoons and every every uh, agency out there and the other cultures, I do exactly what they do. And thank you. Have a nice evening. Thank you, Mr. Toby. I appreciate your comment. All right. Let's uh, see what we have next. Welcome. Hello. Hi there. Uh, my name is Olivia Forsen. I'm from Vera, Florida. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Commissioner, for your time and for allowing me to speak. I'm here today to ask for a human rights ordinance. This would prohibit discrimination based on gender identity, sexual orientation, housing, employment, and public spaces. Currently, LGBTQ people in Brevard do not have protection, basic protection, protections that heterosexual and gender people do not have to worry about. Uh, there's, many LGBTQ people have already been discriminated against. There's no way to go back into the past and change this. However, it is our duty to prevent it from ever happening to someone else again. Without the human rights, rights ordinance, my career friends do not have a future in the bar. They do not have a future knowing that someone could evict them based on the person they love. They do not have a future knowing that there's nothing stopping their employer from firing them because of who they are. Additionally, queer people bring valuable skills to impact our in so many positive ways. An HRO to ensure that our talented LGBTQ people in Brevard to work in hospitals or any other job and continue helping other people without a fear that they could be fired because they are. A home is everyone's big place, a place of stress or just the outside world. Unfortunately, your people in Brevard do not even have the guarantee of their home. They can be evicted um, out of their home, the only reason being their sexual orientation or their gender identity. So I ask, I beg that you sponsor the Human Rights Ordinance. 
Please sponsor legislation that makes it all people are protected. Protect our family, friends, and colleagues. Protect the people we love. Thank you. Thank you so much. Now, Ms. Bentley, I um, apologize for kind of calling on you out of the blue there. I, I know we've been kind of thrown off on a lot of the items on account of COVID and other things that have come up since this was first discussed. Um, do you think either, I guess the next meeting is in a couple days, so that's not going to work necessarily, but do you think in a couple meetings from now you can give us an update in terms of what your office and or HR has, has done or where the research is at this point with respect to the concerns that were raised? And I, and I, I appreciate that, but my, I guess what I'm asking for, just to add a little clarity, is I would, I would appreciate if maybe in board reports, if you could just take a couple minutes and summarize where things are at, because a lot of the folks, the students in particular that raise that, um, I think they would benefit from getting an update. And again, I'm not saying it has to be the next meeting, because that's only a couple days from now, but maybe the, the following meeting, if you could put something together. Thank you. All right, who do we have next? Jacob Galvin, Lober. Welcome, sir. Uh, Mr. Chairman Lober, thank you for letting me in the public speak today. I come again to ask for liberation. I come again to beg for equality. I come again asking one of you here today to sponsor a human rights ordinance and a discrimination based on gender identity or sexual orientation as it pertains to housing and employment. I come asking one of you here today to ban conversion therapy. I come asking you not to simply hear us, but to listen to us, to our stories, to our plight, and to our pain. The report requested at the last meeting has been completed, and the results are inclusive, stating, quote, sexual orientation and gender identity are not specifically included in any of Brevard County's policies, and neither federal nor state law requires them to be considered a protected class. So if you think employment discrimination doesn't happen in Brevard, think again. I have looked into a teacher's eyes as she told me in tears her experience being fired from the school where she worked, her experience being told to leave because she marched in pride, her experience being villainized because she didn't hide who she was, her experience being degraded as a person because she was different, her experience as a second-class citizen. I have looked into a trans person's eyes as they told me, begged me to get this ordinance passed, as they told me, begged me to hurry up because if I didn't, they would lose their job, as they told me, begged me, their employer would fire them the second they found out who they were, as they told me their experience as a second-class citizen. Because queer people in Brevard are exactly that, second-class citizens. Without the protection of the government, we are left suppressed and villainized by a public unwilling to hear our cries for help, a public kicking and already vilified people, a public that looks at me and tells me I am the face of evil. If you think conversion therapy doesn't happen in Brevard, think again. I have looked in the face of a pastor who told me I could be fixed with counseling, who operates out of a church just a 10-minute walk from where I stand today, just a half mile from where I stand today, who told me I was broken, who told me there was a booming reparative therapy industry in Brevard and across the county seeking to fix the vulnerable children. Because even if the trauma caused by this practice kills us, they will never care. They will never see our life as valuable. They will only see it as a mistake, an expendable casualty in the war for purity. But the truth, it is a war for power. And queer people, queer young people, are just collateral damage. I have looked in the eyes of a friend who told me in tears her mother sent her to a Christian therapist when she said she had a crush on a girl. I have looked in the eyes of a friend who told me in tears she couldn't come out because her mother would kick her out if she did. Her mother would leave her homeless if she did. If you think a global pandemic is the wrong time for this action, think again. As we speak, the economy is crashing and the people aren't working, and if you think it's irrelevant, think again. Brevard County needs every worker it can get to recover from this economic catastrophe. How can we work if we can't be hired, and when we are hired, we can be fired just as quickly? I have been spit on, called slurs, shunned, treated differently, cyberbullied, told I'm a mistake. I have been told of the pain I will feel when I burn in hell, but what I don't tell them, I'm already in hell. I'm already burning with the cruel vitriol of hatred expressed the veal of religiosity. So while you are seeking re-election, we are seeking survival. While you are seeking re-election, we are seeking equality. While you are seeking re-election, we are seeking liberation. Thank you. Thank you, sir. All right, who do we have next? Welcome. Uh, hello. If you could just start with your name and the city you reside in, please. Uh, Krishna Tawadia, Merritt Island. Thank you. All right, you've got the floor, sir. 
All right, right now, the resolve of our nation is being put to the test, and we must ensure that we enable each and every American to exercise their God-given right in order to combat it. The state of our nation is nothing like we've ever seen. Right now, we must endure quarantines, the loss of jobs, shortages in grocery stores, and worst of all, the impacts this has for the entire country. Sure, this fight can be won on a national scale, but in order to do so, we must be able to ensure the integrity of the economy on the smallest scale. And each county and community has to make sure that it does everything in its power to make sure its citizens are free to get out there and work so the economy doesn't fail. Sadly, once this quarantine is truly over, rebuilding this county's economy will be an uphill battle. Being on the losing end of this battle for the long term is a tangible and likely event. That means we are going to need every single worker. There can be no one left behind when it comes to getting out there and working to rebuild uh, this economy. The collective resolve our community should have is obvious, yet we have left one stone conspicuously unturned. The lack of a human rights ordinance to allow basic protection to the LGBTQ plus community here in Brevard. Once the pandemic is over in Brevard, if I wanted to work, I would be judged by my value as a worker and the quality of my work. If I were fired, it would be because I actively did something wrong. I do not have to worry about people trying to change my identity because they don't understand it. But look at my friend Jacob, no different from you or I. Simply because of his sexual orientation, he faces a 28% chance of receiving a bad job evaluation and a 41% chance of physical or verbal harassment. And look, those are just the statistics. You heard his opinions. You heard a human being talk to you before, and you must listen to their plight. The lack of a human rights ordinance allows him to be devalued simply because we didn't recognize him as a human being, as a fellow member of our county. Right now, we all have all had ample time to reconsider our stations in life, and the members of the LGBTQ plus community are sure to come to an important realization. Not everyone is a fighter like Jacob. Not everyone is willing to fight for their civil and human rights, and frankly, they shouldn't have to. They shouldn't have to come here and do that. They're simply going to leave, dejected by a county that did not treat them as the human beings and people they were. And why should they stay in a county where the government does not protect them? Right now, we are at an important juncture in our history. We still have a short window of time to prevent these valuable people from leaving us behind. Right now is the time to do more than inquire if the county government protects its LGBTQ plus workers. We must show them that we appreciate them and value them as the members of our society and economy before they leave us unable to recover. These people are our friends, they're human beings, and they're no different from us. Yet they lack the protection that would make them want to stay here. To quote Ronald Reagan, the government exists to protect us from each other. Yet right now, the county is ruining it for them and not protecting them. This is a community who is left dejected and whose work is invaluable. Thank Sir, you. Thank you. I appreciate you coming up for comment. Do we have one more, Mr. Abate? All right. Mr. Carnesale. Yes. Welcome. Vieira, right? Hi. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Okay. Basically, I have my, my two usual ones, which is IRCC needs a right-hand turn off of East Valley Vieira Boulevard onto Independence Avenue into their back gate entrance, and it's, and it's only a matter of time, not if a rear-end collision occurs. Pedestrians, bicyclists, and golf carts travel the sidewalk and are not visible from the road until you're on top of the right-hand turn, and they do not stop for the cars, leaving re residents with a fear of hitting someone if they don't slow down. The short entryway before the gate is another reason the cars making the turn have to slow down below 10 miles per hour and sometimes to stop on Riera Boulevard before making the right-hand turn. The second item basically is IRC, Heron's Landing, and Faith Vieira Lutheran Church all could use a traffic light on the corner where Heron's Landing and IRC exit onto Vieira Boulevard. There is a parallel road, Thrasher, Boule Thrasher Drive, from the Faith Vieira Lutheran Church in Heron's Landing leading to the Heron's Landing exit. That would make it usable for the church as well as Heron's Landing itself on that corner. The third item basically, which I have covered a few, a few dozen times, which is kind of at a, at a, at a dead end at this point, uh, and, I, and I followed Mr. Lober's advice. Um, basically, the Air Company, the F, FDOT, Sheriff's Department have all been involved in, in that. And at this point now, there is, no, there is going to be no golf tra traffic at all on Vieira Boulevard, which now travels over I-95. So that's pretty much a dead issue. 
Um, Vieira Boulevard, I have written to. They are now working with FDOT to try and create, to try and work on the crossover of a little further south, which is already on their long-range plans. Uh, I have another issue, but I do not have time to do that yet, so I'll probably go into the next opening time. You, you've time. still got a minute and 10 seconds if you'd like to start on it. Okay. Basically, you should have all gotten an email, uh, and it had to do with reading the Sunday paper. I saw that the board, less you, Commissioner Lover, voted to restore parking and open the beaches. The main comments seem to be that the people are smart enough to maintain social distance on their own, and the businesses would, would suffer if they were not open. In the course of my travels this weekend, I noticed the parking had, had not been opened yet at Satellite Beach, Patrick Air Force Beach, and Cocoa Beach, and there were electric signs saying no beach parking and no parking on the grass. However, there were multitudes of cars parked on the grass and lots of people parked in the business parking lots, which, which, which would actually discourage business once the business is open. In addition, watching the news on television, it came up, became abundantly clear that the beaches were already overcrowded and social distance rulings were impossible for the people to follow. Not only should no parking rules be maintained at the beaches, but the Sheriff's Department should have patrols of the area to enforce the parking rules with expensive fines. There should also be aerial reviews of the crowds to ensure social distance is being forwarded. Mr. Carlson? Yeah, and I apologize for jumping in here, but, you know, unfortunately, I'm going to have to ask you to pause at that point and then pick up at the next public comment period. No problem. Thank, Thank you. you, sir. I appreciate it. And that's all we have, Mr. Bate, for public comment. Say again? I believe so. Yeah. All right, so we'll move on to public hearings. Uh, H1, I see there's been a request to continue it. So let's go ahead and address that real briefly. We, we do have one public comment for H1. Okay. Let's go ahead and have that. Ms. Bentley, how long do we, we give on this one? Okay, just want to make sure. Welcome, Ms. Rizanka. Good evening. I don't have anything to say. I'm just here to make sure it gets continued. Okay. I think you're going to get your wish on this one. I just right. didn't want to sit outside. It was hot. All right. Who's, uh, whose motion am I seconding? All right. Commissioner Tobias' motion. I'll second it to continue H1 to what date? Say again? September 15th. All right. All in favor of that motion, please say aye. Aye. Any opposed? All right. Continued unanimously. Thanks, Ms. Rizenka. Let's see here, H2, all right, Eddie, Hi. welcome. Thank you. You've got the floor. I got the floor. You do. Um, this is a public hearing for the, um, so we submitted a state revolving fund to do um, approximately 10, $11 million of improvements in the West Cocoa wastewater improvements. As part of the condition, as you saw, we did the, um, and the consent under F7 was the um, uh, permission of the commission to allow the county manager to sign off on documentation. On the, um, the, the planning facility, the facility plan, that's the report that's submitted to uh, the state revolving fund, it's a requirement that that be done through a public hearing and not through consent. Commissioner Pritchett. Motion to approve. I'll go ahead and second your motion to approve. Any discussion on the motion? All right, all in favor of approving item H's in Hotel 2, say aye. 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 Any opposed? All right, H2 passes unanimously. Thanks, Eddie. All right, H3, we're still sticking with D1. Tad, good to see you, sir. Good to see you all. Um, this is a request for the board to conduct the first public hearing to consider entering, entering into a developer's agreement with the Indian River Preserve Estates Corporation relating to the development of Track G inside uh, Indian River Preserve uh, development. It basically is a land swap for some access. Any, uh, any public comment on this one? I believe the applicant is here. Okay. 
Yeah, I think with respect to this, if they get what they want, they're probably not going to be too upset. So is there a motion on this one? Motion to approve. All right, there's a motion to approve. A second from Commissioner Tobaya. All in favor? Say aye. 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 Any opposed? Passes unanimously. If they want to talk, they're still welcome to. <laughs> Thank you, Commissioner. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah, I just didn't want to waste your time. I figure if you're here and you're the, you're the applicant, if it passes, you're going to get what you want. So all's well that ends well. Thank you, sir. All right, let's see here. Eddie again, welcome. I'm back. All right, H4. Okay, H4, um, one or two commission meetings ago, we asked, uh, there was an agenda item, they asked for permission to um, advertise for the um, creation of the ordinance of the um, Merritt Island cap um, capital recovery for phase three. Yes, sir. We've done that. This is the public hearing for that. All right. We have a motion? All right, a motion from Commissioner Pritchett. I'll go ahead and second it. Any discussion on the motion? No comment. Comment? Any comment? No? All right, no comment on the item. All in favor of the motion, say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Passes unanimously. Right. Thanks, Eddie. Thank you. All right, moving right along. H5. Ian. Hey, good evening, Commissioner. Good to see you, sir. Uh, this is a public hearing for CDBG, Community Development Block Grant Coronavirus uh, Stimulus Funds. We are required to do a substantial amendment to our annual action plan to recognize these funds and be able to spend them. Uh, while we are awaiting further direction from HUD, regarding these funds. They did recommend that we bring the substantial amendment forward to get approval. So we've tried to keep it as general as possible so we can be as flexible as possible once that further direction comes in. And also as we try and integrate all the different funds that are coming into the county to make sure we don't duplicate or overlap. Ian, I'm, I'm inclined to support this. I don't know where other folks are. Um, the one thing and the one caveat, and I know we, we may have discussed this already, is I, I really do believe that the commission has an oversight role um, that our, our constituents expect us to play. So if there's anything that's remotely ambiguous, I would just ask, you know, obviously to bring it back to us um, so that we can chime in as to whether or not it's something that we're in favor of. But, you know, based on trying to keep your options open, I certainly don't have a problem supporting it. So any, any other questions or concerns for Ian? Any okay. public comment, Mr. Bate? Uh, no public comment it, on this it's, item. It's actually been advertised. Normally we have to do a 30-day advertisement in the paper to allow for public comment. One of the waivers from HUD allowed us to do a five-day comment. Yeah, I saw that, that in the agenda item. It was really yeah, short. Yeah, so that period has ended, and we did not receive any public comment from that either. Perfect. We have a motion? All right, a motion from Commissioner Pritchett. I'll go ahead and second it. All in favor of approval, say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Perfect. Passes Thank unanimously. You. Thanks, Ian. All right, unfinished business. There is none. New business. We have one item, a big item, J1. And I would just ask on this one if we could get something of a thorough intro. I'll be happy to do that. Thanks, and Mr. I'll Bonte. I'll start with a, a PowerPoint presentation, uh, a brief one. Uh, and let me start by providing an overview that uh, what we're going to be talking about is uh, uh, funds that we received as part of the uh, coronavirus Aid, Relief, and Economic Security Act called the CARES Act. The act was uh, established by the Coronavirus Relief Fund and appropriated um, $150 billion to make payments for specified uses to states and to certain local governments. The state of Florida received $8.3 billion, and as part of that, uh, 12 counties were in a position to receive uh, direct funding. Brevard County was one of those 12 counties. We received $105 million in funds directly due to the size of our population, uh, which is estimated at a little over 600,000 people as, as of July 1, 2019. The, receive, the reason that we received this funding is, and I think it's important to let the board know that, is because city populations were included, and that's what got us over the 500,000 uh, threshold um, and that was utilized in determining whether we not only whether we qualified and that we did qualify but for the amount of funding that we received now this is separate uh, CARES Act funding from other funding that was provided through the other parts of the CARES Act which is appropriated by the federal government um, 
for example, we received 17.8 million in transit. Uh, CDBG that we just looked at was uh, about 848,000. Fire rescue received uh, 462,000 uh, for supplementing Medicare. And Valkyria Airport, you may remember at the last board meeting, received about $30,000. Uh, to utilize CARES Act dollars that we're talking about tonight, um, they can only be used for very restricted uh, purposes. First, the expenditures must be necessary and incurred due to the public health emergency with respect to COVID-19. Number two, they will have to be not accounted for in the budget that was most recently approved as of March 27th, 2020 this year. And number three, they, had to be, they have to be incurred from the period of March 1st, 2020 through December 30th, 2020. Now some important points that you need to, to be attentive to is that um, they need, all these expenses need to be reasonably necessary for the intended use. And while uh, local government uh, can exercise reasonable judgment in spending these CARE Act dollars, uh, they have to be within Treasury guidelines. Uh, the Treasury has issued uh, three uh, frequently asked qu uh, questions, um, guidelines, that um, the most recent of which was actually I sent to the board this morning was issued yesterday. Um, and all these expenditures must be used for actions that are taken uh, to respond to this public health emergency in two broad areas, the first being medical or public health programs uh, and public safety programs. And the second area is for economic support programs. Also, it's important for this board to know that um, we are the local government that received these funds and it has been made very clear to us that we will be responsible for all the funds that are expended including any that if the board decides to uh, reimburse uh, local governments, which is not a requirement under, but it's permissible um, and is something we're looking at and we're looking for board direction for tonight. Um, but we ultimately will be responsible. And that's why staff in the agenda report um, ha is suggesting that we do not have sub-recipient agreements where we just give the money to other entities. We should either um, reimburse them once it's expended and we verify that is an eligible expense, or we provide uh, resources such as a protective equipment um, that qualify for, for this funding that we know uh, we will be in a position to not have uh, any problems when the next item, which is the Inspector General, uh, conducts the monitoring and oversight of these funds, including uh, auditing, which we've been told will be occurring. Uh, so it's important for us to document and verify the expenses. And another important point is that if we do not expend funds by the 30th of December 2020 uh, on a cash basis, we have to have, and it's not for future expenses, expenses that were incurred up to that date, then the remaining funds need to be returned to the U.S. Department of Treasury. And the final bullet is that these funds may not be used to fill shortfalls in government revenue, either directly or indirectly. The guidance is very clear on this, and it's been repeated several times with examples by the Treasury in their um, FAQs. Mr. Bonte, some questions for you, um, just real briefly. With respect to the last item that you mentioned, <clears throat> Obviously, none of us are able to predict the future, um, certainly when it comes to others' actions or inactions. But is it possible that there might be, <clears throat> pardon me, there might be a subsequent amendment to the, um, the requirements to allow for the use of some of these funds as revenue replacement? Um, I have you know, seen the news talk about uh, that there are, are people in Congress that are talking about that as a possibility. So looking at at next year's budget, obviously it's a little bit further away, but my concern is we're, we're probably going to take a hit. Um, to what degree, I, I don't know. I don't know that it's knowable at this point. But if we can leave unallocated the portions that we've not already spent um, where reimbursement would be appropriate, would that potentially 
put us in a position where we either wouldn't have to raise taxes if we'd need to raise them by a slight amount or otherwise where we might not have to raise them as much if we leave that unallocated to see if that comes to pass? Uh, you, the, of course, that would be the board's decision. The only thing that I would emphasize is that all the funds would have to be expended by December 30th. So whatever programs are put in place, we would have to have uh, processes that would assure that those uh, expenditures were made and the cash was paid out before December 30th. So if in fact there was a, uh, an amendment that provided for revenue replacement, once that occurs, the board could take action in that regard. I appreciate it. I, I don't see any lights, so I'll just, I'll, I'll kind of keep going. But my, my position with respect to this, there are a lot of worthy causes, but I, I think that we need to allow the potential for amendment to play itself out a little bit. Um, I am really concerned with what revenue is going to be next year. Uh, I, I don't think we're going to have a, a great year, certainly not um, in relation to what we've seen year over year in the past. Uh, I would suggest if there have been eligible expenses that we, that we use this to reimburse them, certainly for the county's expenses, um, even though it would personally benefit me to reimburse the municipalities because I live in one, I don't know that at this juncture that's necessarily the wisest thing to do because, again, we don't know what the situation with revenue is going to be later on. If it turns out that that, that door is shut on us, um, obviously I would be a little more flexible, but I, I just hate to spend the money and not have it available if there could be a better use or there's some realistic potential there, there might be a better use in the future. Again, though, it's, you know, it's, it's a democracy here. So, Commissioner Pritchett. Yes, sir. Thank you for that. I, I just want to say the next budget will probably be Commissioner Tobias' dream budget. <laughs> yeah. So just to preface that. Oh, but, I love it. <laughs> but um, um, Mr. Bate, I love that you've kind of got some ideas and you've given us an idea of what you want to um, to investigate. My, my, my request would be that you guys maybe get an idea of what you're looking for in these costs. I know uh, a lot of the stipulation on these CARES funds are actually gave you a substantial amount. So you're going to have to tell us how much you're going to need so that we can get an idea of what you want to do with that before we even jump to the municipalities and before we jump to the next group. Um, my guess is since it has to be COVID-19 related, that's going to be a little bit more of a trick to you because I saw right here you cannot use to fulfill shortfalls. So you're going to have to really do a lot of, Miss Jill, you're going to have your work cut out for you. So I, I think the next step is that we agree, to, well, first step, we agree to this, then you're going to have to come back to with this analysis of whether you think there's going to be money left over and how much and how you want to. Is the board interested in me in giving you an overview of the staff report or you've already read it? I, I was prepared to do that if the board uh, Maybe wants for to. the public's benefit, what do you all think? I, I think you guys have done a great job so far, so maybe educate the public if y'all want to, so. Commissioner Snardi? Uh, yes, I mean, I, I think we're commenting basically on what we have in front of us, and, and I, I like the idea. Obviously, the intention was um, to reimburse our costs, the PPE that we had, because we were not just supplying PPE for Brevard County, we're supplying it for other agencies and supplying it for healthcare agencies, et cetera. I, I, I obviously think that we need to reimburse ourselves in that department, but I mean, I understand that the the concern and the caution to hold back some. But what I'm more concerned about is, you know, getting getting the money back to the people as much as possible. As far as the people that are suffering right now, um, I know that obviously we have people that are unemployed. We have people that aren't eating. I mean, just just to have one person and or three people in a day tell you that they don't have a job, they can't feed their kids, they're the sole provider, that's most concerning to me because that money was intended for COVID-19 related expenses and that is directly related to COVID-19, the health and safety of, of the, those individuals and, and the employment status of those individuals. Now, as far as re reimbursing municipalities, I would say, you know, I would encourage or maybe the board has something different in their mind, but I mean, we could reach out to them and find out what their needs are, but. Obviously, I don't want to just write a blank check either. I think that that's sort of reckless and there's no tracking. But find out, you know, maybe sit with them and sit with their managers and find out what their needs are. And if it's reimbursable expenses, you know, that's fine. But I would just encourage maybe the conversation needs to go that those people need to apply through us. And if it's too big for us to handle, because I know we don't have a huge health and human services department. I mean, you guys are extended. I mean, I can imagine what you're going through right now. Then maybe we ask for help to, you know, 
put something in place to help implement some sort of program. I just, I, I don't think the intention of getting all those monies was to sit on it. So I, I, if we get hit again or we have a second wave or something major happens, then obviously I, I would think that we would get more money from the state. That would seem to be probably the case. So I, I just don't, I don't think that that was the intent of these funds is to sit on them and wait. We can't use them for revenue. I mean, that's obvious. So I think we need to get money quickly to the people that need it the most. Commissioner Tobias. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And yes, sir. Thank, I, I want to thank staff for this report here uh, that, that you've obviously spent a lot of time on. Uh, I think you've broken it up into two different groups. Uh, I'd, I'd certainly like to address the first one. Um, you have those clearly identified as steps one through five, um, which are uh, public health program, seven million medical expenditure program, 16 public health compliance, 15 public employment uh, program, two and unobligated CARES Act 21. Um, I think these are directly, uh, as, as you put here, related through the county. I, I think you've done a darn good job with them. Um, I tend to side a little bit more with Commissioner Lober on this and believe that the unallocated uh, can uh, get the remainder of that. However, uh, I would certainly like to see that should the municipalities have issues uh, with PPE that we fully uh, or do our best to refund uh, or provide equipment as much as we can uh, to make sure that they are, are safe in that aspect. But uh, the federal government has spent literally uh, billions and billions of dollars uh, direct uh, payments to individuals, um, loans to small and large businesses, and I'm worried about the duplicative effect that we may have with a limited amount of funds. I think that this would get very difficult if we uh, decided to start handing this out to certain businesses and not others, certain people and not others. If we had an unending supply of money, uh, that would be one thing, but I would hate to see, you know, how we would go about doing that. So. Uh, I think uh, that, uh, that at a minimum that we make sure that the municipalities are fully refunded for the, the, the PPE since they are partners in this. But uh, I will be uh, uh, pretty uh, similar with Commissioner Lober here that this is best left uh, to see if, if we have more flexibility. And if not, let's, this is $2 trillion that doesn't exist. So if this ends up back in the federal government's coffers, it wasn't there to begin with. So I don't think that that's necessarily a bad option before we start picking winners and losers uh, on this. Uh, so uh, that, that's where I stand, certainly to give you author authorization on uh, to go ahead with uh, one through five, just making five, which is the unobligated CARES Act money, uh, larger than the 20 percent that you allocated. Mr. Bonte and then Commissioner Pritchett. Yeah. Uh, oh, I apologize. Was that? Uh, two, two quick items. First, um, we do have eight or nine speakers on this item, so the board may yes, want to hear them as well. And uh, the second would be on those first five items in the staff report and the numbers that we utilized, we were contemplating that for the expenses in each of those areas that either a charter officer, for example, uh, the sheriff, there are significant dollars that could be um, uh, provided under the CARES Act as an eligible expense for a jail, specifically um, sanitizing the jail, uh, appropriate uh, uh, personal distancing in the jail. Uh, is the board okay with us moving forward with that? And then we were also contemplating, and I heard you speak to the issue of a personal protective equipment, but for other expenses that the county reimbursed itself for, if the cities had corresponding uh, expenses, is it okay to include that? Because we thought that might be in there, but if, if the board's saying hold off on that, then you know I'll be clear that that's what we would do. I, I certainly am good as far as the constitutional officers and, and roping them in with us and treating them essentially equivalent to the county. What does everyone else think on that? Commissioner Tobias? I, f I fully I fully agree uh, as you uh, contemplated that and I don't think it's unfair for us for PPE to either reimburse or supply municipalities with the mask and the protective equipment that, that they need uh, 
to carry out a, a safe environment. I, I think that that would be a fair uh, investment. The other four categories, if they have similar expenses, I'm not anticipating it's going to be significant, but I mean, they they may, and I just want to know. I want to be clear that I follow the board's direction that, on that. I, I I would like to see you know personally what under the same guidelines that we've set up for reimbursement, what they believe their expenses would be on those type of not not give you authorization, but at least begin the and conversation. We bring it back, I could bring it back to the board on a monthly basis. That, that way, the board sees it. Yeah, that would I'd, be very helpful. I'd okay. like to see it that way okay. as well. It makes the most sense. Mm -hmm. Commissioner Smith? I'll agree with that also. I think that when, when you start talking big numbers like this, I'm really concerned about the slippery slope that exists that everybody wants a piece of the pie. And of course, we've got our marching orders here that we have to be very restrictive as to how we can use this. But some of the things that I've read I question, and like Commissioner Tobiah, um, this money really doesn't exist. So we're only going to increase, and it's not just us, it's the entire, every county in the, in the country is getting this opportunity. But that doesn't mean that, I, that we shouldn't use some physical restraint in spending these dollars. I think it's important that we have it, and I think it's important that we use them if we, if we need them and we have legitimate needs, but at the same time, I, I don't want to, I don't want to see this money being spent because just because we have it. Commissioner Starty, do you have anything? Yeah, I think I already spoke on it, but I mean, again, I, I think we need to obviously use caution and restraint, but I mean, there's the reality and, and maybe that that's not something that you're hearing a lot of other than, you know, maybe some emails you're getting lately. But there's a lot of people that still haven't gotten unemployment. There's a lot of, and that rent deferred, you know, you have a, you have a um, landlord that defers your rent. I mean, they still have to pay it. And I don't know, I mean, maybe I'm just a little more empathetic because I, I work with, you know, a large population and many that aren't working. But I've heard some horror stories and not just about businesses. It's not just the business owner that loses when they've been closed down for this long. It's all those people that work there. And so if we can find a way to somehow help them, too, that, to me, makes the most sense. That's why that money was given to us. Now, we can give it back to the, to the government, but you can guarantee that they're going to just find another way to spend it. Wrong, right, or indifferent, that's what's going to happen if we send money back. So I would just like to see it more directly into the hands of people that truly need it. And obviously, there would have to be a strict vetting process, and it wouldn't be us just writing blank checks and acting recklessly, and, and everybody, everybody gets money. It's not, it's not that at all. But I think that we need to... That money was given to us to help people affected by COVID. And whether that be an agency that needs PPE or a municipality that needs PPE or the person that needs just a little bit of help right now and we can provide it, I think that we would be doing a large disservice by not helping them. So, Commissioner Pritchett, and then I'll jump in. I believe pretty strongly oh, about that. I apologize. That. I agree with Commissioner Zanardi on this because I believe the state of Florida could have made all these choices, so could the federal government, but they're trying to filter it down to the local governments. So they can get hands on the ground distributing the funds. I think the goal is to distribute the funds. So I am in agreement with um, us taking care of those things that we need to, but I'm also in agreement with the cities because they were added into the population to get the funds. So I, I don't have any problem with us distributing those funds also. And I also agree with um, Commissioner Isnardi on the fact that I think there is extra funds to do these other things with. And ma'am, I agree with you. There's a lot of people, they don't have the funds right now to pay their rent. And then what happens is if you have landlords that live off the rent, they're not getting that income either. So we do have a significant problem in the community. Again, I don't know how to solve all that. I'm gonna leave it up to you, sir. But I think we need to come up with a plan. You guys need to as, as far as that. But I do think we need to reimburse your expenses for what we're spending to keep the community safe. It's definitely made for that. So I would vote with um, Commissioner, I'm trying not to touch my face here, with Commissioner Isnardi's thoughts on this, because I, I think there's more funds that are coming. I'm watching them keep throwing out series of this money because they're trying to get it to the community to help the community to get through this crisis. So I'm, I'm in complete agreement. I think they sent it to us to spend it. I don't want to just throw it out there, but I think this is where we need to be significantly responsible of figuring out where to spend it, but I don't want to hold on to it either. I'd like to figure these places we need it and give it out. And I am not in favor of sending it back unless all the other counties send back their extra 
because we've already made a, uh, we've already crippled the economy moving forward with these extra funds, so we're gonna need this right now to take care of our community also. I'm gonna jump in and I'll, I'll put Fritz in my office um, on the spot, I guess, to a degree by quoting him. So we, we were talking a little bit about this item and about um, what forms of assistance would be available to someone that's recently unemployed on account of this. And I, I jotted down a couple of the things that he mentioned. In addition to the $1,200 stimulus check, they'd be eligible for $600 a week in federal unemployment through July 31st, even if they were a contract worker, retroactive to March 29th if they were unemployed at that time. They'd also be eligible for up to, it looks like, $275 a week for three months, again, retroactive, this even further back to March 9th if they were unemployed at that time. So it, it's not to say that, that there's nothing available for these folks, and I appreciate the fact not in a good sense, I appreciate in the sense that I understand and I'm cognizant of the fact that some folks are not receiving what they need to receive in a timely fashion, but I don't know with us putting together all of the, the, the logistical uh, things that would come in, into play and be entailed with putting together a program like this locally, if we would be able to, to beat the federal or the state system to the punch, even if we were inclined to do that. So I, I just, I have concerns, and maybe it's because for the past you know, nine plus years at this point, I've been in a, a line of work where I don't have the same take home pay every day. I don't have the same take home pay every week or every month. And there've been some, month that, some months that were feasts and other months that were famines. And I'm not saying that it's fair, I'm not saying that it's okay, but I think there has to be some degree of individual responsibility with this, even if they've been put in a situation due to no fault of their own. And I'm, I'm happy to help if we have the ability to help, but I, I don't know the unknowable in terms of what the flexibility will be down the road. And my concern is, again, picking winners and losers, as I believe Commissioner Tobia may have mentioned a little bit earlier. I don't know that it's my place to do that. I do know that people are gonna be hurting not just immediately, but down the road as well. And I'm concerned that if we have to raise taxes, that we do it as little as possible, or if we can avoid it altogether, God bless, let's go that way. Um, but if we don't wait to see what comes out of Congress and we don't wait to see if the restrictions are loosened as there's already been talk by some of the elected officials at that level about, you know, just about doing, uh, we're going to lose that opportunity. So I, I hate to act like the, 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 like the money is burning a hole in our pockets and spending it before we, we know what all of the options may be. And I, I appreciate that there are people that are in tough spots, but again, with 1,200 as a stimulus, 600 from federal unemployment weekly, and then potentially 275 a week on top of that from the, the state. You know, it's, it's not that there is zero money that's available for these folks. It may not be what they're used to bringing in. It may take quite a bit in terms of paperwork. It may even take some time for them to accomplish getting everything submitted and, and verified and vetted. But it's not that they're, they're simply cut off and there's nothing whatsoever available. Commissioner Pritchett? I was just going to ask, Mr. Bate, how long would you think it'll be for you guys can come back with some, some numbers data for us as far as each one of these projects? We are now talking about the economic support programs, the four different ones that were mentioned in the report. Uh, I would suggest that it would be uh, the first meeting that the board can do in uh, which we, you're not meeting in June, so it would be at the very beginning of July. I think it's July 7th or so. So by then, we'd have a little bit more of a handle yeah, on this. Yeah, and what I would suggest is if w whichever of those four programs the board gives us direction to look into, we would go into the community and, uh, uh, excuse me, work with staff and, uh, you know, the city managers group and whoever else, depending on what programs you want and, and whatever board direction to come up with criteria and parameters for board consideration that we would bring back to the board then. Okay, because I, I think, Ian, you're going to have to bring in some information for us, too, so that we have that. Because although the, all those things are going on, there are significant people that are falling through the cracks on this. I don't know how, but they are. So I, I think we need a little more information, and I think that will help greatly is, is what I'm thinking. But I, I need to even know. I don't even know if you got it all spent on the PPE already. I know, that, I know you didn't, but I, I just don't have numbers, and I need them. So um, maybe if we get some data on that, it would help me. I like all the categories you have up here. If we need a blanket approval, that these are all okay moving, all okay moving forward. But I think I would need some more information to be yeah. able to give you good direction. And I, and I know we've had a variety of people waiting. So right, and yeah, and I, I just you know I, I just want to clarify for for their benefit. You know, I'm not 
you know, I was, I was hopeful and I'm hopeful that the discussion the board's having with respect to this item prior to their comment will help them focus and hone their comments as need be. Uh, it's not that we're trying to act without their input, so specifically for that reason, I'm not going to ask for a motion at this point. Let's go ahead and hear from them, but I, I will say to all of them, just to put everyone on notice, I'm going to very strictly adhere to the three-minute limit because I, I know that we have quite a few folks that want to speak, so for, for okay. fairness, we're going to have to hold to that. Welcome. If you just start with your name and the, the city you reside in, I'll go ahead and uh, give you the floor. Yeah, my name is Stacey Patel. I'm from Satellite Beach. And I'm here today to support the allocation of CARES Act funding toward direct financial assistance for local families. A mom of four in Palm Bay wrote me a couple of weeks ago and, any, and asked me if I had any meat or diapers I could share. And I asked if her family needed food the same day. She responded, we have ramen noodles for today, so we should be okay. Another mom of three from Melbourne wrote to me, we have nothing, we have no food, anything. And I said, do you have stuff for breakfast or do I need to come tonight? And she said, I have some rice, I can feed them in the morning. A 69-year-old in Cape Canaveral who's since fallen and is now in the hospital was trying to get through the night on a can of green beans. It's not going to last, I have no car, I can't get food, and I'm 69 and I don't have help. Even before the COVID-19 crisis, Michael had been living with his four kids in a van for months. Another family of three, survivors of domestic abuse, had been in the woods for months, too, despite the fact that her youngest son was four years old in our own backyard. Kids from both families attend local schools. Our systems knew about their prolonged, true homelessness, and we did not have the resources to meet their needs. Our social service safety net in Brevard is failing to catch people, and as thousands of working families face job loss, layoffs, and furloughs, our state has failed to provide a functional system to access unemployment. I'm here today to support the use of the $44 million in providing economic support to the members of our community, including especially direct aid to families with things like rent, mortgage, utility assistance, supplemental unemployment benefits for those who fall in the gap, food delivery to those who are sick or quarantined or who lack transportation, publicly funded testing and contact tracing, and healthcare assistance for uninsured and underinsured families. Today I sent 16 stories from local residents to the commissioners and none of them are the worst. They are the stories from healthcare workers, teachers, hairstylists, musicians, tattoo artists, restaurant workers. Many of them are moms or dads too. And they're just a few of the more than 9,000 folks who have joined together in a local Facebook group to provide aid to one another when no one else will. We've only been around that Facebook page for a few weeks, but we've seen a lot of need in our community in that short time. And we've been able to move folks into hotels and shelter and get them local groceries uh, when they don't have any groceries to feed their children. I'm sure you know that the call volume of 211 has increased significantly and so many families are in need of direct aid. To provide even more context to our request, specifically for mortgage and rental assistance in Orange County, as you may know, the county opened up 1.8 million before the case CARES Act even came to provide $1,200 to 1,500 local families. They received 26,000 applications, which I think only speaks to the depth of the need in our area. It is critical that this allocation Ms. Patel, of $34 million I, I apologize, but you're out of time, ma'am. I apologize. Thank you for coming out for public comment, though. I do appreciate it. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. All right. Uh, who do we have next? Welcome. Hello. Good afternoon. My name is Laurie Allen. I live in Cape Canaveral. I'm here representing the minority small business owner. Um, in the month of April, I had 12 events canceled. Uh, that was approximately $70,000 in revenue that was lost to the small contract labor, the gig workers, the talent, the catering people, the people that are in the production industry, the dancers, all of these people are all 1099 workers. They pay their taxes. Not one person that I know of has received their reemployment check in the state of Florida. Not one. When I filed for unemployment, I filed the last week of March. My last event was March 13th in Miami. I heard all the horror stories of nobody getting able to get in or get online and the crashing, et cetera, et cetera. I got up at 4 o'clock in the morning 
and counted myself as a great success that I finally got through by 7 a.m. That was only three hours of my time. However, I never received any notification that I, they had received my application, that I was on file, that I had a claim number. I received nothing. I have, of the events that I had, the 12 events that were scheduled, only three of them have rescheduled for January, one in Melbourne. Most of these were for nonprofit galas, for autism. They were for children with disabilities. They were all different events. One was for the Port Authority with 1,200 people going. These events will not be back again. We have lost that money. So I reapplied last week for my unemployment on, on April 24th because that's the new mandate. You have to reapply, tw you have to apply twice and get denied twice before they will do that. I still have heard nothing. But surprisingly enough, the initial uh, filing in the last week of March, I also filed at the exact same date for food stamps. And lo and behold, four days later, there's the snap card delivered to my door. So we're getting some things right, just not enough. President Trump included us this time for the first time ever in the CARE Act that we could get benefits in that. But no one is getting it. We, a lot of us waited all day yesterday to hear Governor DeSantis' uh, remedy for what he's doing to fix this. And we heard nothing that, that actually told him what he's doing to fix it. We heard a lot of rhetoric. We heard a lot of that it was our fault, that we had forgotten our own Social Security numbers, and that's why we were not getting our benefits. Governor DeSantis, I know my Social Security number. Trust me, I really do. In Brevard, we don't realize how lucky we are with all of the talent that we've got here. The live music venues are everywhere. Uh, in Miami-Dade, there's only two live music. Broward, there's three. Boca, there's one. We need to protect these people. We have nothing. We need to be taken care of. We need to be heard. We have a lot of brilliance here, all the space centers, but we have a lot of people that are contract laborers that are that, and I want you to please remember us. We count, too. Thank you. Thank you so much for coming up, ma'am. Welcome. Hi, good evening, Commissioners. My name is Katherine Haynes. I'm a resident of Melbourne. Uh, today you have the opportunity to help Brevard citizens. The critical choices you make now in how to allocate the 105 million from the federal coronavirus relief fund bill will profoundly affect how our country, uh, county, excuse me, operates in the future. Last month, Governor DeSantis issued an eviction and foreclosure moratorium. This order is set to expire on May 17th, but unpaid rent during the moratorium will not be forgiven or frozen. This has clear cause and effect, and is why the county needs to provide rental assistance as part of the money from the Coronavirus Aid, Relief, and Economic Security Act. Many landlords cannot continue to maintain or operate their properties without rental income coming in. Therefore, in about two weeks, we are likely to see mass eviction with a significant number of our local citizens permanently displaced and landlords without the income necessary to stay afloat. Through your foresight and leadership, we can ensure that, as a county, we are not saddling more low-income renters with debt and are forcing landlords to foreclose, resulting in losing some of our county's critical low-income housing. Without a local governmental response that provides rental assistance to stop the eviction process, a greater crisis will be created and will result in both landlords and tenants sliding further down the socioeconomic scale. So please direct a good significant portion of the relief funds to assist in maintaining housing for citizens of Brevard that need support through this current situation. Thank you so much for your consideration. Thank you. Welcome. Hello. Michael Branson from Altamont Springs and the president of the Brevard County Firefighters Union. I first would like to extend our condolences to our brothers and sisters with the Sheriff's Department and their recent loss. As we begin to soften our social restrictions due to the COVID-19 event, um, our citizens and visitors of Brevard County are beginning to enjoy what we have to offer. But the Firefighters Union would like to express a few ongoing points. Current research continues to accept that there's a 14-day 14 14 incubation or a contagious period. 
it has become increasingly difficult to normalize the signs and symptoms of this disease, and the parameters to gauge potential infections continues to broaden instead of narrow. This increases risk to the Brevard citizens and your first responders. Social restrictions are beginning to loosen, but for the frontline workers, we must continue the 14 days past these loosening recommendations so that we continue to isolate ourselves and we continue to burden that 14 days past the phase one. Phase one. Testing remains a challenge for first responders as the parameters continue to change for this disease and tests are limited or they haven't been invented yet. It is the expectation and high hopes that we will begin to learn more about the COVID-19 disease. Monitoring will be more effective and we'll be able to get more direction towards our testing. But in addition to the heightened level of response and risks to the county, our ongoing efforts and our infrastructure stability and the commissioner's ability to create a stable environment, the firefighters union is very much aware of the decrease in funding and the increase of cost to the essential functions of government. Even with this acknowledgement, I would like to speak on behalf of the citizens and the first responders and frontline workers of Brevard County. Over the last six weeks, there has been a lot of focus on COVID-19, but we've come to accept that there is a greater good to be had. There's a lot of uncertainty at the beginning of COVID, and it was necessary to direct a lot of energy finding a way to cope with this new evil disease. But I also want to bring light to the fact that we also have to do our core functions. We have to respond to cancer survivors, childbirth, structure fires, ongoing and everyday events of life, and there have been challenges. We've already had little luck this year, had a little luck this year, with a little bit of rain during the brush season. And we have about a month left before we go into hurricane season. So a little luck goes a long way. It is my opinion that the COVID event has had a synergistic effect with the pre-existing stresses to the fire department, public safety sector, and the citizens of Brevard County. I would like to ask the board, as well as the fire rescue management, to consider everything that has been accomplished over the past couple of years. Our relationship has increased and there's been great direction. Please consider the long-term effects of the sacrifices that we are doing right now and how that will take time, months, years, hopefully that will be the end of it, um, to a point of the survivability, and that we can continue to serve the visitors and citizens of Brevard County. Thank you for your time. I appreciate it. Thank you. Hi. Good evening, Commissioners. I'm Rob Rains. I'm President of United Way. I live in Cocoa Beach, Florida. Welcome. I, hi. I came before you on uh, March 30th, 31st at your commission meeting and shared with you a little about uh, the response that uh, Community Foundation for Brevard, the Space Coast Hospital, Hospital Foundation, and United Way, we came together to, to find uh, to form a joint COVID response. And I want to give you a little bit of an update as you're considering the uh, CARES Act funding. Uh, I did I get a chance to look at the memo that uh, uh, County Manager Abante and his team uh, put together, and I thought it was great staff work. And uh, now as you deliberate on, that, on allocating that $105 million that came through Congress, signed by the President, and uh, looking at those kinds of things that are eligible to be spent, that need to be spent by the end of this year, I uh, ask that you consider to spend a significant amount, at least 10%, uh, to help people directly, uh, to help with mortgages and rental assistance, utilities, and food, all, all el eligible expenses. Uh, as I mentioned, we started a, a COVID-19 response fund at United Way. We raised over $330,000 so far. Generous people have called and, and, uh, and pledged their, their gifts. And uh, we set up a system because none of that is easy. If you set that up, it takes a little bit of time. And uh, working with 201 Brevard, we, we recruited counselors and uh, people call in, they get screened in, they get uh, talk to our counselors, and then we make sure that they were indeed laid off or lost income due to COVID-19. We get to uh, make sure that they have an eviction notice or a late notice from a landlord or from a utilities company. Get all that documentation in and then, then help them. I sent you an um, uh, email uh, today that listed uh, our, our responses so far. Roughly, we, we, we've helped about 150 families to the tune of, of over $160,000. About $1,200 per family, those are, those are increasing as we get, get further. And we don't do mortgages. We, we, we made the decision just to do rent because the eviction process for a mortgage was, was a lot longer. Um, but we are very concerned. We're going to run out of money. We, we project we'll run out of money by the end of next week from this funding because of the need and the demand. And uh, the uh, idea, the possibility of the county stepping in and, and helping citizens directly 
uh, is, 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 is an amazing opportunity. And we're not asking for any money uh, to come to, to our organization. It, it, the county uh, health, housing and human services has a lot of experience in doing this. And we do see this as a critical bridge to um, help people before the CARES Act money comes to them, the $600 a week, uh, the $1,200. And that is still a long way away for a lot of folks. And people have been out of work. Some people have been out of work since um, early to mid-March. And while they may not have to pay that rent uh, for April or May because of the eviction, they're going to have to pay that eventually. And uh, the idea that this could be a, a bridge, setting up a system to help families here in need would be helpful. We're in a fight, Mr. and I didn't get Mr. Ains, I, I apologize for cutting you off. I was just going to let you finish the sentence there, but I, I've yeah. got to be fair to everyone, and I, yeah, I do no, appreciate you coming uh, out. Total, total, total fair. Okay. Thank you, Commissioner. Thank you, sir. My name is Sanjay Patel from Satellite Beach. I wanted to read one of the stories from one of your constituents into the record. My name is Bobby. I'm a tattoo artist at Endless Summer Tattoo in Cocoa Beach. I work out of their tattoo studio as an independent contractor. We've been closed due to COVID-19 since March 12th. I live in Cocoa Beach in a house where I'm currently giving a room to my younger brother and his 11-year-old son. I feel that they are truly in need at this time. I don't ask anything of them in return because I know they don't have it. I have always been punctual and paid my bills and rent on time. As of today, I'm now two months behind on my rent, which is $1,500 per month. All the money that I had that I had saved is now gone. Thank God they're not shutting off my utilities. But when this is all over, I'm going to be left in a hole and I feel like I will not be able to get out of it. I have applied for unemployment and have called several times, only to be told I am still not eligible to receive any benefits. It seems I may still not be able to go back to work for a month, if not longer. Even then, things are not going to magically go back to normal. It is going to be a very slow process to get financially stable again. All my coworkers are going through the same thing. None of us have gotten any assistance from unemployment. I have no family here other than my brother who is walking in the same shoes as me. My parents are not in a position to help me at this time because my mom is in the final stages of Alzheimer's. It kills me inside that I cannot help them when I cannot pay my own bills. I know there are many people like myself who can truly benefit from some kind of rental or mortgage assistance. I've got a stack of these stories right here and you were emailed these today. So, I don't envy the position you're in. This is a tough environment for you to make these decisions. But what I want you to think about is, you know, I heard a comment about, you know, there's a 600 bucks a week, there's a 275. Have you actually gone onto the system? I have built websites. It is one of the most atrocious things I've ever seen, the design of this Florida reemployment site. If you have not, Set up a test case, ask the state for one, or better yet, sit down with one of your constituents and try to apply. I don't know a single person who's gotten that 600 bucks a week from the CARES Act. And then on top of that, I still know people who have not gotten their stimulus check. You know, during this time, I think that we have to remind ourselves that the true measure of a society is how we treat the most vulnerable among us. So right now, those people are really struggling. And I hope that you look at them as the priority, as your North Star, when you make these tough decisions. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you, sir. Welcome. Hello, good afternoon. My name is Jane. I'm a healthcare worker. My story is a story of healthcare workers in the nation. And my story is also a story of a mother who tried to feed their kids. I'm a healthcare worker who is very high risk due to my asthma and history of pneumonia and bronchitis. At the beginning of this stay at home order, my doctor wrote an order for me to stay home for a week due to concerns about my exacerbation with my asthma. I was able to go back to work for one day only because I have another asthma attack. My doctor put me in two weeks isolation. All in all, I have used up all my PTOs that I have incurred over the months. I'm back to work and I'm still very careful. 
with my help. All this time, when all of these things was happening, I have adopted three teenagers in my household. Two of those teenagers lost their job. One of them could not even go back to their home because her mother is stuck somewhere outside the country because she also got locked up in a country and had gotten sick. It's okay, we have food on our table. We're a happy family. We tried to be. But I tried to be a responsible citizen like all of you. I pay my taxes. I save up for the rainy days. I even have a 401k. But with all of this happening, I could not believe that I have to withdraw my 401k just because I have other bills. It's not just the mortgage. I have other bills that I have to pay for. My car insurance that never stops. My other bills, my life bills, my water bills, even my health care bills are there. As a person who still has a job, I am very thankful. I still have money coming in. But until when? A month ago, our company had furloughed 32 of the workers. And this is sad because I don't even know how long our company could keep up with all of this going on. I am here to implore all of you in the hopes that you will approve the 44 million allocation and will ensure that it provides mortgage, rental assistance, food delivery, supplemental unemployment, publicly funded testing and contract tracing, healthcare assistance for the uninsured and underinsured families, and other direct aid to our community. A thriving community will directly impact the Brevard community. I hope you consider that not all of us have extra money to pay for all of this. A lot of our people out there are struggling. Thank you. Ma'am, before you go, just for the clerk's benefit as well, would you mind repeating your name and, and the city of residence? Yes, my name is Jane Hernando. I live in West Melbourne. Thank you so much for coming out. I appreciate it. Thank you. Welcome. Good evening, commissioners. Uh, my name is Keith Donnell, um, and I live in Melbourne. Um, I have a private uh, family foundation there called Steady Town that does a lot of community development work. And I'm here tonight as a member of a countywide task force that will be making funding allocation recommendations to the board of, a, of the Brevard Homeless Coalition for some other federal CARES Act relief that we expect to be coming into our county to directly respond to community health and safety concerns around homelessness during this time. Um, these funds are fairly significant and I wanted to bring that to your attention. Um, I, about $700,000 of potential additional funding that I can tell and the early work of our task force is we're looking to put a significant allocation of that towards homeless prevention efforts which we think is very important during this time where there's um, so, so much great pressure put on this on the homelessness services system. Um, and I, I've been around this sector and working in this uh, space for a while, um, and I've seen this issue from the business side of things, from the health side, from the human side, and it's, it's not often that a system sees a new injection of, fun, of dollars like this. And I, I just wanted to speak briefly tonight about what we are thinking as part of that task force um, you see, right now, our system of care in our county for responding to homelessness concerns, which really do affect our whole community, um, is very fragmented. It does not see a lot of leverage in terms of the dollars. It's confusing to people. It's honestly lots of little charities doing the best they can and woefully underfunded. It's my view, and I know some others on the task force share the same view, that now represents a real opportunity to move the needle a bit, build some new capacity focused on health and safety, and get everyone rowing in the same direction to help prevent homelessness during this time. I ask for you to consider following what we are doing and the recommendations coming out of the Brevard Homeless Coalition regarding the use of these funds and considering as we go how county CRF funds um, uh, can play a role potentially in a reimbursement capacity. Um, and not looking at that not as a support as kind of a one-off thing, but looking at it as an investment that can create some leverage and strengthen what is right now, in my assessment, a very weak system. 
Thank you. Thank you, sir. Welcome. Good evening. I apologize. Didn't mean to cut you off there. <laughs> Um, well, I was just going to say thank you for giving us this opportunity. Um, my name is Teresa Grimison. I am a resident of Indian Harbor Beach, but I work in Melbourne. I'm the president and CEO of the Community Foundation for Brevard, and we work with philanthropists uh, to realize their intentions into our county for its health and vitality. And we also work closely with nonprofit organizations throughout the county. I also have been serving in a volunteer capacity with the Brevard Homeless Coalition uh, task force that Keith Donald just described and uh, which has been a tremendous uh, insight for me even though I do uh, accomplish some work in that arena to really understand the depth and the breadth of the issue that's at hand. I also am working hand in hand with Rob Rains with the United Way of Brevard and also John At Gimley who's the CEO of the Space, excuse me, Space Coast Health Foundation. You know in early March we all said to each other, this problem is coming down fast. It is so much bigger than the three of us individually, and even working together, it's bigger than we are. But we came together across, um, you know, crossing different ways of doing things, different ways of tackling an issue, to say, let's do what we can and make sure it happens and happens quickly. I think you heard some numbers a little bit earlier from, uh, from Rob. Um, but it has been tremendous what working together has been allowed us to do. And very, very quickly we've been able to get uh, $300,000 uh, split, I would say, roughly between uh, individual families that are being hit the hardest as well as organizations that are working on the front lines. Obviously, this is coming down the pike, and we are just touching the surface of it. And so I stand with uh, Commissioner Nardi and Commissioner Pritchett and, and um, hopefully others, when you were saying, let's take action. This is our time. Um, I would like to add, too, that, you know, when this was coming, and I was uh, working with Ocean Breeze Elementary School, as that's where my two children go to school, um, you know, as they were doing an incredible job of getting the distance learning program going. I've been in awe of what they've pulled off in literally two weeks' time. But I quickly reached out to the administrators and teachers there that I work most closely with to say, look, when you hear the need, please let me know. Because these are the resources that, uh, that are, we can at least point you to right away. And immediately, I heard back. The need is huge. And that was you know, a month and a half ago. And it's just building. We're all hearing the numbers. So I urge all of us to reach across, like we did with United Way of Brevard and Space Coast Health Foundation, we're talking twice a week minimum, to try to tackle this problem when we need you to step in and be part of that team. Thank you, ma'am. I appreciate you coming you. out. Do we have any more, Mr. Bonte? One more. One more, all right, last but not least. Maybe? Okay. <laughs> Welcome. If you could just start with your name and the city you reside in, please. Name, oh. Yes, ma'am. Name more Thomas Titusville. Thank you. You've got the floor. I got the floor. Okay. Yes, How the coronavirus affected me? As a disabled person, I have been isolated, quarantined in my home for the last two months. No transportation, no way to get to medical appointments, no way to get on medication, no no assistance at all in Titusville. We're just lost out there. They have no one, no one to call, no meals, nothing. No toilet paper. It's like everybody's for self. Okay. Now we open it back up the state, the governor is open back up the state, and now we have eviction notices coming out. There's no housing for us. You know, we can't move. There's no way to relocate because the apartments here in Bavard County is a two bedroom, the minimum is $1,600. So people on fixed income like myself, where do we go? Where do we start from? We need help. Somebody help us. That's what I'm saying. Help us, please. 
from Titusville to the hospital, calling Uber is $85. $85 from Titusville to Holmes Hospital in Melbourne. From Titusville to Vieira Hospital is $70. This is cash money we have to pay because the medical assistance e netted whatever, they don't want to take us because we're sick, okay? Yes, I am a survivor of colon cancer. Right now I have a port that needs flush. I have no flush. I can't get it flush because my doctor's appointment is pushed back. I don't know when, so i got to get a new port. Also, I medication. I can't get my medication because it's at, at Walmart. Catching Uber is $13 one way from my apartment to Titusville um, Walmart. One Walmart in Titusville. $26 back and forth on a fixed income of $800. What do I do, sir? I'm a, I, if I have to fill out an application today, I might as well say I'm a convict because I've been a prisoner in my own house for a whole two months. Two months. I can't go to the hospital in Titusville because they're only a stage three hospital. So a person with cancer, patient like me, I have to go to home or help, but they call it help first. So I have to pay that $70. I got to pay that $85. And that's one way. Lift. I have my receipts in my bag. One way. We need help, sir. So this care money, please. Distribute it to people. We need help. I see other counties that are helping people. Nothing here. We need help. I'm asking. Please. We're stuck. There's no public transportation in Titusville. To walk, I'm walking from here all the way to 95 to get public transportation. As you see the size of me, that ain't working no time today. I'm not walking from here there. I, I apologize, but you're out of time. Jim, okay, thanks. If, if you would hang, hang on just one sec, Jim. If you wanted to, if, if you want to put this on the record and relay it, I would certainly okay. appreciate. It. Let me let me get your mic on. Okay, you're good now. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I didn't get the lady's name, but if she calls Space Coast Area Transit, call the administrative office six three five seven eight one five. Hit extension zero, then ask for Carmen. Uh, Carmen's last name is Bias. She's the customer service supervisor. She can help her with transportation in Titusville. Because so you you come into you come into Plumetto, you come into our apartment complex in Titusville. I can't give you the exact details of where you are in Titusville, but yeah, they do paratransit, which is door to door transportation. Thank you, because I ha I do have Medicare. I do I yeah. do have that, yeah. but I have to walk. I have to walk yeah. lots of miles just to get to the post office yeah. or to anything. Yeah, uh, I need help, sir. Okay, please so call. Please, please help us. Okay, please call Carmen, and I'll give Carmen a heads up tonight that you'll be calling. Thanks, Jim. I appreciate Carmen, it. Thank you. I will call Carmen. Okay. okay yeah. And okay. If, if you if you need to get the number again, or if, if you have any questions, if you go to brevardfl.legistar.com, mm -hmm. you can pull up this video and then have any portion of it repeated. So if it's a question as to the name or the number, or the extension or anything, just just pull it up that way if you would. Okay. One more question, sir. When is your next meeting? Say again? Oh, our next meeting, it's two days from now on Thursday. And can I be here too? Absolutely. Here? Yeah, please. I'll, I'll I, I be would, here too. Yeah, I would I'll encourage you to come back. Yeah, let okay, us, I'll be here. Yeah, I'll please let us know how it goes. I'll be here. Okay. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you, okay. ma'am. All right. Is that it for public comment, Mr. Uh, I believe it is. That's it. All right. Thank you all. All right. So let's, uh, let's see where we are. I think when we went to public comment, Commissioner Tobias was talking about the approval of one through five, obviously adjusting the amount of five. The couple questions, Mr. Abate, that you posed, as I recall, were whether or not to include the constitutional offices. It seemed the consensus was yes. The other question was whether or not to come back to the BOCC uh, for approval on the municipal expenses. And it seemed to be that was where the leaning was, but I'll, I'll reopen it now that we've had our public comment. Oh, it's in the cost? Okay. Commissioner Tobias, do I don't know if you want to make a motion or how you want to handle it. Uh, yeah, and just to be clear, uh, I do appreciate one through five. When, when you go and ask, and I'm sure you'll do this anyway, but when you speak with our partners in the municipalities, 
Um, I think if you could keep it as constrained as the county has kept it constrained, uh, I, I don't think you'll ask him, hey, what, what, what do you need money for if you do it from the perspective of the way we're spending money and not let them expand right. that? You we'll make sure that it's for the same eligible expenses that we're using for the county, and that's it. Thank you. Commissioner Pritchett? Yeah, are you going to do this in two different motions, or are we going to do it all together when we get there? I'm, I'm fine to take them however you all want to pose them. If you want to sever it so that you support part and not another part, that's perfectly fine. If you don't want to do it that way, however you all want. Okay, I'm, I'm probably good. I've been talking to Mr. Abate here in between. I can't lean over and talk to him. And I asked him about the other four, and he said that um, Mr. Gold can actually handle the um, – three out of the four of the small business that they'd have to do something different, but he would be able to, so we wouldn't have to send this out or, or do something different. You would actually be able to do um, the analysis on this and, and give us information. And Commissioner um, Lober, I just want to tell you on this, yes, and I, I thought you would like this, the, the program that's helping the ones that, um, um, that we were talking about, these are only the ones that he's talking about in here that are not covered by state or federal assistance already. It certainly makes it better. I, I thought you would like that. So I think, um, um, Mr. Abate, you're going to still probably need help if, for the small business, which I think is probably going to be important, too, for those ones falling through the cracks. But I like these four that you have, and I also feel more, more comfortable that you, now that you told me Mr. Gold will be the one that is going to oversee those ones. So I'm, I'm, I'm in agreement with all of these, but, of course, you're going to have to get us those numbers and let us know what you got going on. But I think you, you picked four good ones. And anytime we're going to do anything, someone's going to have to pick the winners and losers. I get it. But this is a good um, area to cover for food, shelter, and the small businesses, which we seem to all greatly support. So I, I think you've got a good thing here. Thank you for allowing me to ask you a few questions. And I appreciate your patience, sir. I want to make sure I'm not skipping anyone over at the edge here. The peanut gallery? <laughs> oh, I, I wouldn't call it that. I kind of so, want to see where this goes. Can, uh, uh, Mr. Bate, I apologize. Please. No, no. So are we going to get a motion on the first five? I was kind of just eyeballing to see who wanted to jump on this one. <laughs> Please. Uh, Mr. Chair, I'd like to make a motion to accept the uh, staff recommendations for items one, two, three, four, five. Uh, with the allocation of the remaining uh, being held in unobligated CARES Acts until appropriate time. Uh, also, uh, give you authority to speak with the municipalities uh, concerning their needs uh, on items one through four. That would be the Perfect. Motion. So we have a motion from Commissioner Tobias, second from Commissioner Smith. As far as... Yeah, I, yeah I, I think it was left out of this particular proposal. Now, granted, with the unallocated portion, I would presume, and certainly if Commissioner Tobias does bring it up in the future, I certainly will. Um, I, I just want to get a little further down, and I, I don't recall the July date that you had mentioned, Mr. Abate, offhand, but there was a July date for a meeting uh, that I believe it was contemplated this would come back on. Yeah, I believe it's the 7th. That would allow us to have that discussion again with Mr. Gold, bringing back some ideas. Yes, and I, I'm I'll happy to have us. that at that point. I just okay. I think we'll be in a better position in terms of you know having all of the ducks in a row. Commissioner Rizdarni? I feel like I'm in school. I have to raise my hand because yes, I can't yes, hit a button. That's okay. As long as you let me speak, I'm good. Sure. My concern is July 7th is a bit far out, and that's a lot of allo unallocated funds. And even if um, we could we could use a portion of that. I think I would feel a little better about um, supporting this because it's not that I don't support the first five items. Obviously, I do. I just think that that's a large chunk of money that could go, um, you know, if we could take a piece of that to help some people, you know, with e either emergency bills or food, I would be more apt to support this as it stands because I support, again, the premise of the five items, of course, but I would like us to use a little more of those monies, and I don't want to wait till July. People need the help now. I don't want to wait till July to use, the, use those funds. So I know Commissioner Tobias is not going to amend his motion to, to use any of that money, I'm guessing. So I'm not going to support this based on that because I think that we're leaving too much money on the table that we should be 
giving directly to people because that's what it's designed for. I understand where you're coming from. I certainly do. And I, I'm somewhat conflicted on this, but I, I think in an abundance of caution, taking our time and doing this in a way that may not be perfect, but it certainly puts us in a position where we'll have all of the knowledge we possibly could get within a reasonable amount of time. I, I, I would be more comfortable doing it that way. Commissioner Pritchett. I agree with Commissioner Znardi. I also agree with you too, sir. But the question is, since we have Mr. Mr. E, and I'm just going to call you that, he has the ability to right now to know some maybe some um, items right now that he feels would be very um, it'd be a good place to spend the money. So um, what do you, what if we gave him up to a certain percentage that he could go ahead and start working on some of these now? Because guys, there's seriously some people that fall through the cracks, and that's what this money's for and there's that much left over that's unobligated. So I think we should at least give him something to move on. I'm sure he's not going to spend $44 million for July, but maybe if we could give him to give us an idea of what he feels like right now, responsibly that he feels that should be used right now to at least three of these four items. Is that okay? Well, yeah, I mean, you certainly want to make a motion after we pass this to do that. I will, sir. Just well, let's, sure I got three of you before we do it. Do you, would you prefer to do it that way? I'm, I'm fine with that as well. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we'll, we'll vote on the motion as stated and seconded now, and then we'll, we'll revisit it and determine whether or not, as far as the portion that's unallocated, whether we're going to allocate a small portion of the unallocated portion. Everyone on, on board with that? All right. Okay, so I'll, I'll go ahead and call the question as to the motion again as stated by Commissioner Tobias and as seconded by Commissioner Smith. <coughs> All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Nay. Right. Nay. All right. We've got one, one in opposition, Commissioner Pritchett, so it passes 4-1. Um, now, in terms of your motion, can let's... Can we still do that? Because yeah. he didn't want to use those funds. Sure. And we, we, can, we can address... We can address I think that. there was some confusion on the motion. You, yeah, I did get confused. If I'm someone sorry. wants to move to reconsider it, I'm happy to address that. But let's, before we start making motions... Well, I'll make a motion to reconsider, just so we're not confused on what we're doing. Okay. We agreed about, to... We agreed they read it to us? Because I... But we agreed to have another motion. Right. And let me... And I'm happy to entertain that motion, but maybe the best at this point is to have Ian come up and then hear from Mr. Golden in terms of what it is he's proposing so we can figure out whether or not the subsequent motion is really going to go anywhere. You're starting to do things the way I do. So. Is that okay? Yeah. <laughs> I guess. If that's I mean, if you prefer to do it differently, you're the I'm chair. To... You're the chair. You're the boss. It's I mean, fine. If, if you want, I mean, if you want to just make a motion to reconsider, But I can I'll, guarantee I'll that. That, that Ian Golding is not going to get up here and talk about how much money he needs. I can guarantee you because he's not, he's not setting policy and he, he works for the county. So he's going to say, I need money, but he's not going to really say how he feels because that's not, and he's not in a position to do that. So, and I, I, I hesitate, you know, obviously asking you too many direct questions because I don't want to put you on the spot. I hate putting them in the middle too. So if you want, I mean, however you want to do it, if you want to make a motion, I'll, I'll certainly accept any motion you want to make. Well, I made that, I, I voted for that based on the, on the idea that the, that the board was going to vote, make a second board vote on the unallocated funds. Right, and that's, that's how I intended to So maybe to I proceed. shouldn't have voted for it because there's no guarantee because we could choose not to vote. On it, but that's just silly. Now, again, I mean, as to the unallocated portion, I'm happy to entertain a motion to allocate a certain percentage or a certain dollar value of that. There's nothing that precludes that from being done at this point. Okay. So maybe Commissioner Pritchett, since I was going to say Commissioner Pritchett, yeah, go let's, ahead. let's. I'm going to kind of give you the reins a moment. You wanted Ian to come up, so let's hear from Mr. Golden. Whatever questions you want to ask him, I just want to make sure everyone is fully ventilated as to this, so that we're not doing something that someone's not on board with. Yes, and. and Commissioner Isnardi is correct. I'm, I'm not going to make a recommendation for funding at this point. Uh, I will tell you that there is a need, that we are looking at a wave of people with the moratorium on evictions and foreclosures coming on May 17th for people to be facing that. I will tell you, though, we do have a policy, a procedure to already do a mortgage and rental assistance program. So we have something that would just have to be modified that we could potentially bring forward for you to see at the meeting on the 19th to give you an idea of what a program would look like with some of the information that we would look for to vet people, to determine eligibility, and to also cap the amounts that people would be eligible for. So are, are, you, are you comfortable if we wait to the 19th for you to come and, and talk to us? Or 
I, I would think it that, be that's at the board's discretion, but I'm just telling you what, I, could, you what I feel I could bring to you on the 19th if, if that would help you make a decision. Allocate it like 25% of this money for you right now once you guys come back with better numbers for us in July? That's up to the board's discretion. I understand where he's coming would... from. I think he doesn't want to get in the middle of this, and okay. I don't blame him. Commissioner Isnardi, what's your <laughs> idea if, if you want to do all of it or you want to do percent? He's going to come back in July, but he might need funds now, So, and I won't get him to tell and me. I, and I think an important point to bring, there's a moratorium on rental assistance and that sort of thing, but that rent is still due. It's not like the rent's been waived. Yeah. So, you know, as much as I'd like to say, you know, I don't want to point fingers, but there's many in this room that don't have to worry about paying their rent, and there's a lot more people out there that do. And I just, my heart goes out to them. This isn't, we're not talking about CBO funding. We're not talking about tax dollars being used to pay for stuff. This money was allocated specifically to go directly to COVID assistance. So that's why I'm so adamant about it. Usually I'm on the other side saying government doesn't need to get involved with charity. Government doesn't need to, but but this money is specific to to. COVID issues. So I, I think it would, we would be doing a disservice to our community if we didn't use it for that. And That's a large pot of money. So I mean, at least half of that money needs to go directly to the people, at least. And then you save the other half contingent because we may need to help them some more and then we can reallocate. But you have a program. I'm, and we also have an emergency program for bills, correct? Like for utilities? Mr. Colton? We, we do. Um, and one of the things that we've been talking about with Frank and as his staff is what I mentioned earlier with the CDBG CV funds, trying to make sure that we don't duplicate. Right. <clears throat> so, you know, you won't see it in here. <clears throat> Excuse me. But uh, utility assistance. Our LIHEAP program is getting an influx of funds separate from these dollars oh, okay. out of CARES. So that's why direct utility payments aren't included in this. Uh, okay. But security and utility deposits are, because that's not covered by that program. So we're trying to make sure that we maximize the dollars that we, we are looking at coming into the county to make sure that we don't duplicate, that we're not having people dipping into multiple sources for the same bills. So we are, we are definitely going to be looking at that. The other thing that we internally in the department have been looking at is expanding the uh, eligibility criteria. Typically, our normal funding sources cap at like 80% of area median income. So that might, for a family of four, be about $55,000. But we're talking about going up to maybe 140, 200%, because we have people who, four months ago, two-income family were making 120000 a year. Now, because of COVID, they might be making half of that or less, depending on which of the, the, the members of the family lost their jobs. So we want to be able to make sure that we're also being able to serve those people also in this interim and try and expand it out to serve as many as possible. Right. I know, I know business owners that loaded up pe their employees' cars with groceries because they were out of work for the last six weeks. It's just, I don't think people fully realize it until you see it and touch it. And that money is going to sit there based on an unknown, but at the same time, we, we know there's a problem now. People are struggling now, and it, we just need to do the right thing here, and, and I, I want to see us use that money. I think we should just let Mr. Gold just use the money as he needs it right now for these items, and then we need to work on a small business. And I think July, you guys have come back with, with some strategic plans for that and sort of things. You're not going to go through that much money in two months. But as Commissioner has already said, I would hate for so, someone to get evicted, be homeless. It, it's going to create a bigger problem than... But we're probably going to have to give him some sort of parameters, maybe a cap. I think what I he'd like that. to do is to come back on uh, the 19th with what the cap would be and what the parameters would be. That would be Could we release perfect. some of it now, though? So, you're, so some people who, I mean, you have the program in place. Could we release a portion of it now so we're not waiting till May the 19th if someone needs help in the next two weeks? Yeah, that's up to the board. We can yeah. release some I mean, to it, it would be something you could implement right away. Sorry. Let the county manager to have some discretion until they get back to us? No, well, he's yeah, saying I'm no. I'm not in a position nobody to, wants to, to exercise. Nobody wants no, responsibility. I'm just They're not, not going to be here <laughs> for Thursday. Oh, that's so right. That's right. Yeah. Okay, okay. Let's, let's pick a number. Well, I, I, I mean, will tell you that the, the policy that we currently have that we're looking at updating, um, it caps the amount of assistance to an individual or a household at $4,000. And that was for uh, when we were doing after Hurricane Irma 
we did that program for rental assistance. And that may, but that may be a little bit high for one household be. because if we're trying to stretch those funds and help and that, more that people. Was, that was for the insurance deductible program. I, I believe right. we capped the individual assistance for mortgage and rent at 2000 a Perfect. household. So can we, can we, I mean, I don't even know that we've got the votes to do it, but can we release a certain amount to the 19th? Would you, you can be make a motion to do anything you'd like, including that. Yeah, absolutely. You can do that. Maybe release 10% of it to him, up to 10% right now, and then he's not going to use it. But 10% yeah, yeah, uh, of what number? The 44. So 4.4 4 million between yeah, now up and to that. It, yeah. And we probably won't even come close to spending no. half of that. Okay, I'll make a motion to release up to 10% of the unallocated funds um, for the CARES Act until May the 19th when we revise or we reconsider what to do with the rest. Second. It's kind of a sloppy motion, but. <laughs> okay, so we have a motion from Commissioner Rizzardi, a second from Commissioner Smith. Commissioner Tobias? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. We sound a lot like the federal government just making up numbers here, um, and it's scary. Uh, a couple questions, Mr. Golden, I don't ever mind putting you on the spot. Uh, obviously, COVID has changed the paradigm when it comes to sheltering folks during a hurricane. We'd have to take certain precautions uh, that would uh, account for extreme amounts of uh, capital funding to accomplish social distancing. And if you don't know the answer, that's fine. How much would that cost? I, I will definitely say I don't know the answer. I and and I, is I'm it sorry. your understanding that that would be eligible for uh, funding under this program? My understanding for, from the way the CARES Act works, anything that we would do for hurricane season that would be in excess of what we would normally do would be eligible for funding. Okay. So I, my, my point is there are, when we say unallocated, it, it's not just money floating out around. There are lots of potential expenses out there that the county may incur that we may not be able to reimburse. Um, PPE is very important for our municipal partners. Uh, do you have any idea uh, what would we authorize Mr. Abate to go out and find out what the potential cost for the cities are, items one, two, three, and four? Do you have any idea what they're going to come back with? We've asked for them to start looking at that information. We it's haven't received anything uh, from them on that yet. I know that emergency management is working with them on the PPE stuff, but okay. uh, the other c categories we... We'll be talking to them tomorrow afternoon after tonight's board meeting this, to start those dialogues. Yeah, this is one of the few times when I ask a question and I get an answer I don't know. It's absolutely okay. I, 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 <laughs> I am extremely concerned that we start allocating funds when we don't know what the expenses of the county uh, could potentially be. So let's le deal with this 4.4 million bucks. Um, uh, the 10 percent of the remaining four, 44 million bucks. You said. The programs are capped at four thousand dollars. That I believe that was. I, I haven't seen it. I, b I believe that was for the uh, assistance with deductibles. I think for the rental and mortgage assistance under that program, I believe it capped at two thousand. Okay, I'm I'm just just randomly throwing numbers here. That's about eleven 1 hundred families. Um, do you believe that there will be more? Families in in I have no idea that, that will be in need uh, of of the this type of assistance in Brevard County is more than six hundred thousand. I, I think it's possible. Yes. Until we have a fair measure of what that number will be, um, would it be a little premature to offer a cap to a certain to, to a certain amount uh, and then zeroing out everyone else who may you know fall outside of those parameters? I think that having a cap on the funds is a good idea. I don't know that capping services until you get a better idea and allowing those 1,100 some odd people potentially to move into homelessness or whatever that, that next phase is for not being able to pay their current bill. Um, I think that would be an issue too because then the dollars that you would need to take them out of that situation down the road would be even, for, even greater. You, you mentioned, you helped me, uh, you mentioned uh, a family of four, I think mm -hmm. you gave an example, and I think Commissioner 
uh, or Chairman Lober mentioned, uh, help me a little bit more with tho those folks. Uh, my understanding is the federal government has provided direct assistance to the family four that you said $1,200 per adult, that's $2,400, plus $500 per kid, assuming they're 17 or younger. So, you know, we're at $3,500 already uh, before they've received any type of uh, unemployment assistance. Uh, and even if the state is behind this, all of that has been handled or will be handled retroactively from uh, the state and the federal, my understanding, is, is going pretty well, that being the bulk of the $600 a week. So um, what are we looking at? What are we looking at rent here, the average well, rent and, here? And one of the things that we do <clears throat> and that we did with that prior program is we looked at the other assistance that people were getting. And based on that assistance, they may not be eligible for assistance under this program. But the point is, everyone, <clears throat> everyone under that seventy-five thousand. But you also have some people who that so, that uh, tax refund that they got. Some people aren't going to get those until September, if they're in the people who submitted their taxes pa by paper. They have to wait until a further point down the road to be able to get that check from the federal government. So now they're looking at this time period where they don't have that. And they may or may not get unemployment. Um, I think right now, currently, about 40% of the people who are applying for unemployment are not getting that. Either they're determined ineligible or because of the system and the time frame to get through it. As of this morning, it was 46, yes. Okay. Yep. <clears throat> so there are those other issues. And the idea is to potentially look at these funds, as Commissioner Isnardi said, to get them back out into the community, to give people that, that safety net to get them to those other things that are becoming, going to be coming in place for them. Hopefully, we're going to have businesses reopen. Hopefully, most of these people are going to get their jobs back. But as was mentioned earlier, they're still going to have to pay that rent that was deferred, that mortgage that was deferred. All of those things are still going to have to be paid and they're going to have this gap in their funds to try and do that. Or as we heard from one of the uh, speakers, you know, they dip into their 401ks, those other things. <clears throat> Excuse me. Which the federal government, just to be clear, has taken away the penalty for dipping in the 401k. They have, yes. But I don't know, at least we've not gotten any indication yet that there's any plan or anything under the current ones that are specifically for a rental assistance. There's been talk about things down the road, just as Commissioner Lower had mentioned, you know, that, you know, there's still discussions about how the counties can use it, whether it can be used for revenue shortfalls. That's discussions. There's additional discussions at the federal level about another stimulus fund for just yep. states and counties. So there, there's a lot of moving parts. Um, one, again, like I said, with my public uh, <clears throat> hearing on CDBG, one of the reasons I kept that general is to try and account for those changing environments and the changing situation as the feds and others kind of try and hone in a little bit more on these dollars and what they're expecting to see. Are there other programs other than direct rent assistance or, or mortgage assistance that we can help people with food assistance instead of? Well, and I was going to ask for some clarification on the motion because my understanding was it was we were looking at those three items outside of the business piece, which did include the food, did include the security utility deposit, and as well as the rental mortgage assistance. That was that was my understanding of the motion. So the answer would be yes. Thank yes, you. yeah, yes, food, yes, food. To be clear, yes. I, I'm I with. The multitude of programs that the federal government has put out there, uh, Commissioner Chairman Lober mentioned uh, many of them. Uh, I, I, I think we're just duplicating uh, program assistance that has already uh, been out there. Uh, I think direct assistance for food, uh, especially if we target it at, at, at the elderly and we target it at uh, young folks, I think is probably uh, best, but I, I can't, um, w with the amount of money that has uh, been borrowed from future generations, I, I don't, I, I cannot see handouts for uh, rental assistance or, or mortgage assistance at this time when thousands and thousands of dollars have already come from the federal government. Commissioner Pritchett. Yeah, I, I think what we were trying to do is I think we like these categories. We don't have enough details yet to figure out how you're going to allocate those. But 
um, my objective is I don't want to tie your hand now if we have people that need it right now. And I, I like that we have things not otherwise covered by state or federal assistance. And I like that you're in play here and, and you're the guy. I probably wouldn't want to dish this out to other entities right now, but I think that gives me a comfort right now for the next two weeks that we haven't tied your hands and you're able to do that. I, I didn't throw you money saying spend this. I don't think you would do that. So I, I just didn't want to have you handicapped right now. If someone's about to get evicted out of their house or they can't feed their family and, and that lady not be able to get to uh, medical, that broke my heart too. So I, I hate this time period we're in. We didn't do this, but I'm, I'm thankful we have some funds however we're getting them because this is going to be app this is just i don't know i don't even want to talk about that part right now because i oh my goodness but i i think as commissioner is already said these were given to us on purpose to get it into the community so we don't create another crisis on top of the crisis we're in right now you get a homeless family you know you're talking about a few months rent I, i've seen the statistics a homeless family can cost up to one hundred twenty thousand dollars on taxpayer cost as far as those things that you need to just take care of them because they're not living in a home so it's expensive so sir i just want to make that statement and i um do we make a motion and second already yes i think yes. there's a motion oh, okay. and a second i just want to make a quick comment Gardner, if you're done mr Pritchett. um so again let's restate that these people aren't going to be eligible for these funds if they receive assistance elsewhere correct I mean, if they receive federal assistance elsewhere. I, I, think, I think the plan, <clears throat> typically what we'll do is we'll look at what their need is versus what they've received in assistance. I mean, if they were getting $600 a week unemployment, they Correct. were getting all this money, they would not be eligible for right. assistance from and the it, county. If, they, if their rent is $400 a month and they got $1,200, well, they're not going to need assistance for three months for, for rent potentially. Correct. But Correct. if their rent is $1,600 a month yes. and they've gotten $1,200, that person might be eligible for assistance. Yeah, and so, I mean, again, this money was allocated for this purpose. I think it would be a disservice to our community if we didn't use it for that purpose. Obviously, 10% is a large number. I don't even expect that you'll use a quarter of that, probably, maybe, no. yeah, not even, probably. No. However, I, I, I believe that this is the right thing to do. I think people are suffering now, and if we can provide that help, we need to do it. I mean, that's what that money, we can send it back to the federal government if we want to, but we know they're just going to misspend it in some other way, or they're going to give it to a community that says that they need more money. So, again, we all pay taxes, some of us a lot more than others. Um, I'm not one of them that pays a ton of taxes because I'm not probably as wealthy as many people in this room, but we all pay taxes. This is where our tax dollars are, are, came back to us to help our community we need, to, we need to step up and do that. We can't talk about hypotheticals. What we know now is that people are suffering. That's what we know now. That's not a hypothetical. That's not a maybe. We know people are suffering, and we, we know we have the ability to help them, so we need to help them. So I'm done. Rant Mr. over off my pedestal. Mr. Bache. Uh, and I just want uh, to be clear so everyone knows that we will be very diligent to assure that's not just the criteria that exists because quite honestly that will not qualify for CARES reimbursement and I know that's what the board wants. Right. We have to be certain that it's a COVID-19 related, i.e. you lost your job because of that correct, um, or some other qualifying event. So we will be sure that whatever we start with uh, includes all that because otherwise if, if we spend those monies, uh, we could end up having a reimburse for it. So we will make sure that criteria is part of what is put together. I and appreciate, you, I appreciate uh, Frank, you restating that because there, that, that's yes. huge. I mean, yeah. it's a pretty important statement that you just and, made. And the Treasury made it very clear to us. For example, you can't just give it to seniors because they're seniors. You have to have the delta of what the difference is between uh, right. what we normally would have done or what a program would have done and what was caused by the COVID-19 uh, crisis. So uh, we will be sure to include all that. Because we, we all knew that up here, discussing it. We, it's all part of our package. It was probably mentioned in the beginning, but I, I appreciate you mentioning it again, so yeah, there's no misunderstanding. Yeah, when we have that criteria on the right. uh, application, we want people to understand why it's there. Right. Well, I'd like to just interject. Is it, it's oh, hang, hang on, Commissioner Smith. Let me get your mic. It's extremely important that people understand that, that you have parameters. Yes. And it's just not because somebody wants money. 
they're going to have to show the need that fit those parameters. Yes. All right, sounds like the question's been called. So all in favor, say aye. Aye. All opposed, say nay. 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 All right, passes 3-2 with Commissioners Tobiah and myself in the negative. That was one of those no-win votes, I think. And, and for clarification, <laughs> would that include the BCR change request that we need to do that? Yes. Your motion? Yes. Okay, thank you. All right. So I don't think we have anything further in the way of public comment. And nothing else left on the agenda other than... Oh, we do. All right. Perfect. All right. Welcome, sir. Hi. It's me again, Pete Connesal, Oviera, um, to try and finish off what I started before. <laughs> and that was yes, related sir. to the opening of the Brevard Beaches that you both voted on last week which I believe to be a mistake. And I'm just going to pick up kind of where I left off. Watching the news on television on Sunday, it became abundantly clear that the Brevard beaches were overcrowded, and social distancing rules were impossible for the people to follow. Not only should no parking rules be maintained at the beaches, but the Sheriff's Department should have patrols of the area to enforce the parking rules with expensive parking fines. There should also be aerial reviews of the crowds to ensure social distancing is being followed. And if it is not, then police vehicles should enter the beaches and close them completely. I would like the economy to come back as soon as possible and, and as medically safe as all of you do. However, it is evident that we cannot assume people will make their own decisions rationally when they have been cooped up for the length of time that has elapsed. As a result, I believe we should go back to no parking at the beaches and implement the shortened hours, morning and night, that even the residents can use the beaches. That will eliminate the bulk of the out-of-towners and reduce the number of residents as well. That may be enough to make the social distancing possible. The decision to end is, in the end is yours, but I fear a risk of the virus coming back into our county and a result requiring worse restrictions having to be implemented and for a longer time frame is a possibility. I believe we should be concentrating more on the needs of the public right now in terms of medical, housing, and such than we should be on trying to get the beaches open. Thank you. Thank you, sir. All right, any, any further public comment that you're aware uh, of, I Mr. Bonte? I think that was it for the public comment. No, that's all public comments. All right. Thank you all. Okay, so we'll move on to the last item, Ellison Lima for board reports. Mr. Abate? Yes, I have a one item. Please. Um, while the Florida Department of Health has been providing the no-cost testing for the last couple of months, um, and there's been some private entities providing testing as well, we have an opportunity from the Florida Department of Emergency Management to uh, set up, they're willing to set up a drive-through state-run testing site in the population center of Brevard County, which would end up being in Palm Bay. Uh, we would have to organize um, and get a testing site. Uh, we started looking at that, something like maybe the parking lot at Eastern Florida, and um, it would be something that the state would run. Uh, we, the county would have no costs, and uh, so if the board is interested in us doing that, uh, we're going to move forward with that and, and in conjunction with that, set up some additional um, sites, temporary uh, free testing sites up in North Brevard, Central Brevard, and the beaches. Um, this Florida Department of Emergency Management has offered us 4,000 testing um, kits, and they will pay for the, uh, uh, the, the testing uh, being performed. So if the board's good with that, we'll identify the three sites and we'll move forward with all that. Sounds like a no-brainer. Do you need a motion? Um, if the board would like to make a motion on it, that would be fine. And then uh, emergency management will uh, put the program together and we'll Mr. contact Chair, the I would like to make Sounds a, like motion. a motion. Fair enough. All Let right, I'll that. second the motion for <clears throat> Commissioner Smith. Everyone clear on what the motion is? Perfect. All in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed? None. Passes unanimously. Perfect. All right. 
What else do you have, Mr. Bate? Uh, actually, it was 2,000 kits, not 4,000, so I misspoke. But anyway, we'll move forward with we'll that. We'll let it slide this time. Thank you. That's it. <laughs> All right. Ms. Bentley? No report. Commissioner Pritchett? No. Commissioner Tobias? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, and I spoke with Mr. Calkins about this I, before I asked uh, him to make any changes on forms. I wanted to get board consent on this. Um, there's many times a miscommunication with people uh, who are building or remodeling in uh, Brevard County. The, the, the applicants or the person that actually is having the job done um, usually, many times hears from the builder that it's the county's concern, that the county is not in fact processing um, the, the applications in an expeditious fashion. I've checked into this a few times for constituents and I can tell you each and every time it is not the case. It is extremely uh, diligent uh, work that is being handled by that department, but it's very easy for the builder to blame the county. So uh, what I wanted, uh, what I asked, asked Mr. Calkins to do was on the applications to add in a line for the email address for the actual applicant, whoever owns the address, that way they would see the exact same communications that uh, the builder was getting. So there was no miscommunications as to the speed uh, of the processing that the, the county is doing. I think that uh, this would make it a lot harder for builders than to blame the county uh, for slow processing when the uh, applicant has all of the uh, required documentations that just how quickly that is being done. Um, many times uh, they'll blame it on the county and yet there's four or five recommendations of why it didn't meet code one way or another. Uh, m my point is that the county is doing the right thing and unfortunately they're getting blamed for it. So all I'm asking is that a line be put on the application that keeps the actual owner of the property in the loop and uh, I'd like to, with you guys' approval, make a motion uh, to implement changes necessary to copy homeowners on communications regarding uh, permits. I've been told that this can be handled as quick as quickly as June 1. There should be little to no cost uh, as far as uh, county expenditures. Second. And I would also like to mention that I concur. I've seen that, heard it a lot. But I'd also like to pat our folks on the back because I've had a number of builders tell me that things are so much better than they were two and three and four years ago that they can get their permits quickly now. So we're doing a great job and we need, we need exactly what you're talking about to protect the county and to, to expose these builders for the, the careless people that they are sometimes. I'm not gonna comment on that last item, but I will call the question. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Passes unanimously. And I, I will say Tad has done an excellent job in managing the department. Um, although I do miss Aaron. Uh, new Aaron, or I believe his name is actually Jeff. <laughs> He's been great as well. Commissioner Smith. No report. Commissioner Isnardi. No report. All right, we'll go ahead and adjourn at 742 then. Thank you all. The opinions expressed by any member of the public during any period of public comment do not necessarily reflect the views or opinions of the Board of County Commissioners of Brevard County, Florida, Space Coast Government Television, or the program sponsor and are solely those of the presenter. The Board of County Commissioners of Brevard County, Florida, Space Coast Government Television, and the program sponsor hereby expressly disclaim any and all responsibility or liability for any defamatory or slanderous statements expressed by any member of the public during any such period.